There we go then. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the 28th meeting of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Members and the public should take all, uh, turn off all your mobile phones and blackberries as leaving them in flight mode or on silent will affect the broadcasting system. And uh, this is agenda item one. First of all, subordinate legislation. And this item today is for the committee to consider a negative instrument as listed on the agenda on rural development contracts. Members should note that no motion to annul has been received in relation to this instrument. Um, I refer members to the paper and ask the committee if it is agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendation in relation to this instrument. Are we agreed? agreed. Thank you very much. So we move to ag agenda item two, Aquaculture uh, and Fisheries Scotland Bill. And this is our second evidence session in the bill. And today we'll have a round table discussion on part one of the bill and matters relating specifically to aquaculture and those aspects of part five, which also they also relate to aquaculture. Uh, so I welcome everybody here. Um, I would like to go round the table and uh, get people just to introduce themselves, just to say who they are, not to make a speech. Uh, we'll have plenty of questions for you uh, in due course, and uh, we wish to make this flow as well as we can. If the discussion can flow, it will be able to uh, do so through you indicating to me if you wish to speak and not speaking over other people. Uh, so we look forward to your participation and uh, having a positive uh, event this morning because it's important for us as the lay people to understand uh, what the intricacies of this are. So starting on my left with Alan Wells. Hello, I'm uh, Alan Wells from the Association of Salmon Fishery Boards. Steve Bracken, Business Support Manager with Marine Harvest and Chair of the Improved Containment Working Group. Uh, just talking to the St Andrews. Phil Thomas, uh, I'm the chairman, independent chairman of the Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation. Uh, I'm not, as I think it says on your papers, a chief executive. Um, I might have aspirations to be the chief executive, but that's not the case. <laughs> Randall Fritchards, Institute of Aquaculture at Stirling, and the chair of the Healthier Fish Working Group of the Ministerial Working Group. Alex Adrian, I manage aquaculture business for the Crown Estate. Dr. Sinclair, I'm a fish farming specialist for the Sea A minute. Sorry. <laughs> to you. Oh, uh, good morning, Matthew. Uh, I'm Councillor George Farlow, Vice Chair of Highland Council's Planning, Environment and Development Committee. And as I said, Douglas Sinclair, Fish Farming Specialist with SEPA. I'm Ken Whelan. Um, I'm Research Director with the Atlantic Salmon Trust. I'm Guy Lindley Adams. I'm Solicitor with the Salmon and Trout Association's Aquaculture Campaign. And I'm Alex Kininmanth, uh, Policy Officer with the Scottish Wildlife Trust. Thank you very much. And uh, my colleagues uh, who have the purple uh, boards uh, around here are the members of this committee. Um, to kick off with, um, I have a general question, I think, to help us uh, get sight of the, uh, the bill. Um, we need some comments, I think, about the 2007 Act, which I was uh, a member of this committee at that time. So I recall the debates, if not in intricate detail, uh, but nevertheless do. Has it worked in tackling sea lice and fish farm es escapes? And if not, why not? Who would like to kick off with a comment about the 2007 Act? Phil Thomas, please. Uh, the, I think in regard to the points you've raised, the 2007 Act is, is really pretty comprehensive in the sense that um, <coughs> it gives Marine Scotland in particular total access to all farm records on every farm in Scotland. It gives them uh, very substantial powers to demand that farms uh, correct any, any uh, activity that... that uh, the, the fishing health inspectors feel that uh, needs to be corrected. And in the ultimate, it has, in effect, the power to fish health inspectors to take over and run farms. 
So it's, it's, it's a pretty extensive piece of legislation in that regard. Okay, thank you. Um, Alan Wells. I think uh, one, of the, one of the difficulties uh, with, with some of the powers that Phil, Phil has just talked about is that he's quite right, the 2007 Act does allow Scottish ministers to require the execution of such works or the taking of other steps for the purpose of prevention, control or reduction of parasites. But we've been informed by the, the Fish Health Inspectorate who are responsible for that, uh, that those powers are limited to uh, problems with regard to the farm fish, the fish within the cages, and they don't actually extend to the health and welfare of wild fish. Now, personally, we don't actually believe that the 2007 Act specifically precludes action to be taken for the health of wild fish, but uh, it would be very useful if, uh, if that's not the case, that the bill would... that the 2007 Act was amended to allow that action to take place. So it's very specifically about the health and welfare of the fish within the cages, but equally we're more concerned about the health, well, we are equally concerned about the health and welfare of the fish outside the cages, the wild fish. Okay. Uh, Guy Lundley Adams. Well, the same point as Alan's just made, that, that there is a lacuna in the law um, as currently interpreted by the Fish Health Inspectorate that um, the inspectorate, for example, if they go to a farm, find a severe lice problem, they cannot order a lice treatment for the benefit of wild fish, they can for the benefit of the farmed fish. It's a welfare issue rather than an environmental, wider environment issue. Okay. George Farlow. Um, I was, we were wondering why uh, the medicine and the biomass production weren't related. On, on, a, on a terrestrial farm, you, would, you wouldn't, um, the health, you wouldn't let the uh, livestock health suffer because of lack of medicine, I don't see why that shouldn't be the case in the sea loch. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. Douglas Sinclair. I can, I, I can perhaps respond to, to George's point that that issue was certainly discussed in the consultation about aligning biomass and, and let's say, treatable biomass. At the minute we authorise amounts of medicine that our models suggest are appropriate for the environment and we are we license the, the level of biomass that is appropriate at a given fish farm. And those two numbers aren't necessarily aligned at each fish farm. But we would say it's for the fish farmer to ensure that he holds a level of stock in his farm that can be treated responsibly using the medicines that are available. So it's a, it's a husbandry issue in our view. Yeah, Alan Wells. I just, uh, j j just pick up on that. It was one of the things I noticed from the, from the SSPO response was that uh, a missed opportunity with regard to the SSPO was a power for Scottish ministers to allow them to instruct SEPA to vary a car licence, which almost inevitably would mean an increase in a car licence for treatment. But that wouldn't necessarily be taking into account the environmental effects of that, of that medicine. Actually, I think that the, uh, Councillor Farlow's point is, is correct from that point of view. Rather than allowing an un unconsented treatment with the associated issues, it would be far better to ensure that the permitted biomass and the permitted sea lice treatments are linked. Um, so basically, that uh, you can't, shouldn't be permitted to hold more fish than you can effectively treat at any given time. Okay. Phil Thomas. Uh, it's really to pick up on the point that Alan made initially and Guy followed up with. Uh, it's, it's a wrong perception that the Fish Health Inspectorate can't take action in relation to well fish, because the code that the Fish Health Inspectorate inspect to uh, has adopted the elements of the industry code uh, that have treatment limits in relation to uh, guidance on when you give treatment, for example, in the spring right to the autumn and so on. And the Fish, Fish Health Inspector have the ability to follow that code. That, that's the code they, they inspect to. Uh, so that the, the perception is actually wrong. I think the thing that is, is tricky and is often lost in this particular uh, element of the debate is there seems to be assumption that, that sea lice come from fish farms. Um, sea lice are there, and indeed for many fish farmers, the most problematic issue is what happens when you get a run of mature fish uh, coming in, that are bringing sea lice in, and you get a sea lice strike onto farms. So then you have a situation where you can have very rapid increases in sea lice numbers. And the particular point about varying the car license is where you have that sort of uh, situation where you have a critical incidence occurring, it would be helpful for the car license to be varied so you can take care of that specific instance very promptly. Right, well, I'm going to bring in Nigel Dawn at this stage because we can home in on sea lice, I think, at the moment. Uh, in thank, you, thank you very much, convener. Um, I've been 
actually intrigued by what I've learned over the last few weeks, trying to work out what is really going on out there. And I'm wondering, given there are a lot of very capable people around the table here, whether you can, you can help me just understand a little bit more of the science of this, please. Um, and I'd like to ask several questions quite deliberately. I know it's the wrong way to ask questions, but hopefully it will open up the debate rather than just get one question answered. I'm conscious that wild smolts will, if I can do the diagram, come down the river, sit in the sea loch, and then eventually go to sea. And let's have the model where that sea loch has a fish farm in it. Now, I think we have to accept that if there's a fish farm there, then there must at least be some reservoir potentially of lice. So if there weren't a fish farm there, then potentially there would at least be a smaller reservoir. So we can see that that might have an effect on smolts going to sea, picking up lice before they go to sea. And we know that that has something to do with mortality. So I think I, think I can respect all of that. What I have no understanding of is how the lice that are potentially on fish inside nets get onto smolts that are outside the nets. Whether a further <coughs> net that was some distance beyond that would effectively stop lice from moving between the two populations of wild and, and farmed. Um, and I suppose the other thing that I have no understanding of is how long those smolts might be in the sea loch in their passage from river to sea. And equally, as Phil Thomas has just mentioned, how long fish might be in that sea loch having come back from sea before they then move up the river to spawn. So there seems to be a lot of um, uh, scientific stuff in here that I'm pleading complete ignorance on. I don't think we've seen any of it in the papers. I wonder if people could work their way through the model of that please, to give us some idea as to how lice move around in this environment, which where people have different vested interests, we understand that. How do these lice move around? How can we control them? Because that might enable us to work out how we can protect all the vested interests, because I'm sure that's what we really want to do. Um, Professor uh, Randolph Richards. I think it's worth pointing out that the life cycle of these lice is quite complex. It involves a number of stages, which starts off with an egg stage, which hatches out into free swimming stages in the sea, that which then go through a further molt and then eventually get onto fish. And the um, cycle then goes through a number of molts on the fish until they reach an adult stage, which generally then the females will produce eggs which continue the cycle. And that takes several weeks to, to progress. And um, when we discuss these issues in the Healthier Fish Working Group, the, the whole concept of when treatment should occur was really to protect the wild fish, to avoid that infectious cycle being um, continued, um, not so much as a problem with, with welfare of farmed fish. Um, at the same time, we had to be aware that the more frequently the treatment was, was undertaken, the more likelihood there was of developing resistance to particular products. So there's a balance between those two things. Um, so that, that any smolts that are going out to sea are more likely to be subject to infection from pre-living stages out in the sea and then go through that cycle. The advantage of the monitoring that goes on within the fish farm situation is that we can monitor the different stages developing through the life cycle of the fish. Um, we can see the, the, the lice going from stage to stage and we'll know in advance uh, when adult stages are likely to be developed. And this means that you, you're already warned of when a treatment is going to be likely. So there's advance warning, treatment is put into place, and the levels that we've chosen uh, take account of smoke migration to try and reduce that impact to, to as little as we possibly can. Thank you. Um, uh, is it uh, Ken? Thank Ken you, Kavir. Um, I think that's a very interesting challenge in terms of, if I may just work my way down through the points for you, I think it is very useful to be able to do that. Yes, you're quite right in terms of the smolts moving out. Can I perhaps separate out sea trout from salmon? Because I think it's important to separate the two out because the behaviour is quite different. Um, certainly in the context of salmon, the salmon are trying to get to the big corridor, the highway that's going to bring them north as quickly as they can. Salmon have a tendency to move through the bays much quicker than the sea trout. A lot of the sea trout, the bays are actually their homes. And therefore, the sea trout are in many ways much more likely to pick up large numbers of lice than salmon are in the round because of the fact that they're in the location. Um, the tiny stages that uh, Professor Richards mentioned in terms of the free-swimming stages, there is no real way physically that I'm aware of you could possibly contain those. 
once they get out into the environment, some really interesting research in Scotland over the last few years has shown quite clearly that they can actually end up in the interface between the fresh and the salt water moving around in the bays. And they're basically looking for a host at this stage. They're looking for uh, an animal on which they can actually settle. And obviously, they, they don't separate between, out between the fish that are in the cages and the wild fish that are actually in the bays. So in terms of how long the fish stay in the sea locks, we don't have a lot of information about that. It's certainly a gap that we need to fill in. But at this stage, in the context of the small amount of research that has been done, um, it would seem that the salmon, as I say, have a tendency to move out that much quicker than the sea trout. The other important thing, certainly in the context of a lot of the published literature, is uh, to think about the very early stages of the lice rather than the bigger lice that you see the photographs of. Because generally, the biggest problem that can occur is where you have a very large release of juvenile lice synchronously with a small drum. And if you get what in technical terms is known as an epizootic, where you basically have a bloom of these very tiny lice appear in the bay, that then can pose quite a major risk to any salmonid that's in that particular bay. And it's in those situations where you have an epizootic in the bay, that's when you get the really intense infestations of the lice. And to a lay person, the lice that would be causing the problem would not even appear as lice. They're like dust on the fins, on the back fin, on the tail of the fish. So that um, period when the smolts go to sea, keeping that period clear in terms of those epizootics between March and May in any given year, that's the absolute critical period within which the management has to take place. Thank you. Um, several people want to come in now. So first of all, Alan Wells, and then Steve Bracken, and then uh, Professor Todd. I think a, a lot of what, what, what I wanted to say has already been covered. Certainly, I would emphasise the difference well, between sea trout and salmon. We don't repeat. I, things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I did want to pick up on something that, that, that Phil Thomas said <coughs> earlier on, was, which was that sea lice um, come, come from wild fish. Now. Originally, for, for sure, these are a natural parasite, and clearly the original, original infestations came from wild fish. But I, I don't think we're in any position to say where an individual louse has come from, and, and, and we certainly can't track a juvenile louse because of the complexities we've been talking about from any given host um, to, to, to the, the subsequent infection. So scientifically, we can't say where an individual sea louse has come from, whether it's come from a farm or a wild fish, and the chances are it's a bit of both. Okay, Steve Bracken. Uh, <clears throat> just two points. Uh, just to pick up on what Alan said just now, it's important to stress that when smolts go to sea, they don't have any lice on them. They are completely lice-free. So they do acquire lice uh, in the marine environment. Uh, the second point is just to pick up on what Ken was saying. Um, the, the idea of, of, a, of a net, a secondary net, going around a fish farm uh, to try and trap lice or keep lice out... Uh, I think wouldn't work given the size of mesh that would be required to, to stop those lice coming near the farm. Um, if we tried that, we know that you would reduce the oxygen flow to the fish on the farm, which ultimately could kill your fish. Thank you. Professor Todd. Um, <clears throat> thank you, convener. Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate that the, the sizes of these lice larvae are so small, you're talking less than a millimetre, it's, it's physically impossible to contain them. And one of the consequences, therefore, is that Gravid females on farm fish will be releasing, by definition, releasing larvae to the wider environment. Now, within a field or a sea lock, that gives a farm a problem, a potential problem, a reinfestation of its own stocks. But by definition, it must also impact upon any adjacent wild stocks. But these impacts go beyond just the local environment because the juvenile lice that uh, emigrating smolts pick up, by the time those lice become reproductive, those smolts will be in the Norwegian Sea. They will be interacting with East Coast Scotland fish, with Norwegian fish, with Russian fish. They will be cross-infecting. And the genetic analyses that we ran some years ago showed that genetically the population of Lepiothyrus in the North Atlantic is a single population because, A, the larvae are transported, but, B, the fish also move very large distances. I think two other important um, <clears throat> points are that Lepiothyrus is extremely unusual amongst parasites in showing 100% prevalence on wild fish. The vast majority of parasites 
infection levels very seldom get anywhere near 100%. By chance alone, some hosts will not be infected. So you have to actually look at this animal in terms of either it's extraordinarily effective at finding the fish, or more likely, the behaviour of the fish is such that it is always going to be in the right place to encounter the parasite. So you cannot underestimate the efficacy of this parasite in maintaining that host-parasite relationship. Um, uh, Phil Thomas and then <coughs> Alec Petrie. It's, it's just a point of detail, but an important one. Um, on the basis, what, what's been said is quite correct. The um, area where you would get problems is where sea lice on fish, on farm fish, for example, were shedding the, the, uh, the, the, the juvenile elements that become free swimming. But the whole of the street treatment strategy that the industry has adopted since the early 1990s has been geared to the fact of, of counting sea lice on farm fish and treating before that shedding stage. So treating the adults so you don't get the shedding. So that's an important part of the total. Now the thing that becomes uh, difficult in terms of, uh, for example, the strikes that you get where you get uh, wild runs of salmon coming in with heavy infestations of lice coming back from sea, is that the transfer that you get uh, from the wild salmon to farm salmon at that stage tend to be a mixture of lice of different stages, so that you actually get lice that are quite close to mature transferring, as well as getting the, the, um, the, the free swimming stage transferring. Can on there? Because what I thought I'd heard up to now was the suggestion that lice don't transfer, it's just the the very first stages, and I'm not quite sure what the word is, that's so small that it gets out and about and the bloom was mentioned. Now, if I've understood Phil Thomas are right, he's suggesting that mature fish coming back would bring lice at different stages, which might transfer, which actually is not what I thought everybody else had told me. I had understood, I think, or assumed, concluded, that, that a mature louse wasn't going to transfer. Well, it's going to stick with its host. Is, is that wrong? <coughs> Chairman, through you, the predominant route of transfer is, is of the free swimming stage. That's right. very clear. But you do have situations, you see it, uh, uh, there are two different types of sea lice, without getting too complicated, uh, uh, one of which very often comes in not on salmonids but, but on other, other fish species. Uh, and, and there you can get quite a range of transfer coming through, and you also can get, get from the salmonids. But you're quite right, the dominant um, route of transfer is through the free swimming stage. Thank you. Look, we have got specifics that we need to move on to uh, regarding sea lice, and uh, I would perhaps, uh, after Alex Adrian speaks, move us on to specific questions about uh, the... Uh, level of uh, the issue in the industry and so on and if uh, Mr Don's not going to ask that you're going to do that at, just after this okay and then yeah. Alec Ferguson will come in as well after that. Thank you convener. I think it's important to remember um, in, in the discussions that we don't get caught up in thinking there are absolutes here. These, these are biological interactions subject to a high degree of variability, both commercially uh, from, from, from husbandry and management practices, from the prevalence and the, uh, the uh, well, prevalence of wild fish uh, and their stock status, plus environmental variables plus, and seasonal cycles. And so there is no, in this regard, uh, silver bullet, I would suggest, in finding the solution and saying this is all about it. These are biological interactions that need to be monitored and managed, I would stress. And so therefore, coming back to um, the very first question about the bill and where the 2007 and this current bill differ, is that this bill advocates that exactly that, the management, the engagement that will lead to the management of these interactions. Because I think uh, both from the wild fishery side and from the farmed fish side, there are there are there are variables and and, and uh, events, if you like, on a seasonal basis that will either increase or decrease the severity of of uh, and the prevalence of particular infestations, and that needs to be borne in mind. It is an ongoing management issue. It is no, there is no point at which, I, in my view, you will say we have sorted this out in the absence of possibly a vaccine or something like that. But in the current in the in the current climate, it is it is, it is a case of ongoing communication and management and I would stress at a level that is 
pertinent to the prevailing local conditions. This is not necessarily a national solution either. It is very much working at a local level where the practical manifestation of both farmed and wild fish status can be most easily dealt with. Um, one specific further question from um, Nigel Dawn. Yeah. Well, thank you. Could I, could, I, could I then ask about the publication of data on, yep. on sea lice? Um, we've heard differing views on this. Would the publication of, of data on sea lice at an individual farm level actually pose a problem for the industry, please? Aren't they going to be published eventually anyway? And there's another one afterwards, yeah. Who would like to answer that? I right. Can I just point out that you said at the beginning that there was total access to records under the 2007 Act? Absolutely right. And if that's the case then, in, in, in the light of this question, when are all these figures going to be published? Well, let me put the context. The fish farming industry, like agriculture and like all other parts of the food chain, works under a normal regime of statutory regu regulation. Uh, and this is common across the piece. And that started regulation in all sectors of industry it works on the basis uh, of, of having legally set uh, uh, rules and regulations and an inspectorate system that, uh, that operates alongside that. And that's a system that aquaculture operates uh, under at the moment. Now, as it happens, the aquaculture industry has gone further than that. Uh, and I have to say partly for its own reasons, this isn't entirely altruistic, uh, for the last uh, two years, we have been publishing area-based uh, sea lice counts across areas. Uh, the, the ideal, in some ways, frankly, would be if there was a monitoring system that was based on free-swimming sea lice in, in lock waters everywhere, because that would provide the information both for the industry and also for the wild fish uh, uh, sector. Uh, what we uh, have agreed to uh, do at this stage taking account of the, the, the wild fish uh, considerations further, is to move from the area basis that we've been publishing on, which is a six uh, areas across Scotland, which is what we had analysed from uh, a sea lice uh, epidemiological standpoint was the thing that was most appropriate, uh, granted, I think, with, with, with our own uh, interests there, to a situation where we will break this down to 26 to 28 areas, so it will be a much finer uh, disaggregation. Uh, the, you, you say, um, why not just simply publish for, for every farm? Well, A, that wouldn't really contribute very much, uh, in my view. It's, it's a sea lice in an area that are the, uh, the issue, plus the fact that there's a, almost a moral situation, if I can put it that way, as far as the farmer is concerned, where a farmer has a strike from a sea lice coming through in the wild. It seems unreasonable, from, from, uh, certainly from my standpoint, that you would be saying to that farmer, uh, you have to put those figures in the uh, public domain. Uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, uh, Alex Ferguson, for example, uh, would react in exactly the same way if I came back and, and said, uh, every single uh, tick infection you have on your farm, you need to have up on a website. It is something that, that uh, is not normal business practice in any part of the food chain. Uh, right, well, I think you've been named, Mr. Ferguson. I thought I recognised it, convener. Um, <laughs> uh, and thank you, and I, I, I take the point that is made, but sorry, can I Please continue? Uh, uh, you're correct. Uh, I no longer farm, but when I did, and if I did farm now, every treatment I undertook uh, against tick would have to be recorded in a logbook, made available to the Department of Agriculture on inspection, and that's publicly available. Every other sector, as I understand it, that collects site-specific emissions data has to report that to a regulatory body, which will then publish that data. What, why convince me why salmon farmers should be any different? Because yeah, I'm afraid. Well, I, I, would, so I, 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 I do. I mean, I, I would dis disagree on the detail of that. Uh, I, I think the you know, technicality. You, you, let me put it this way: you point me to um, any area at all where individual uh, disease occurrence or, or a lice or tick occurrence uh, that would occur on farms is published. There's a, a, a forest of hands here. We have another. I'll, I'll here, leave it to other, I'm happy to leave it to others. <laughs> but you can come back. You know, uh, first of all, uh, Douglas Sinclair had his hand up first. 
I think the point that, that Phil makes, convener, is, is correct in that you know you're talking about ectoparasites, so parasites on the outside of animals, be they lice or cattle or sheep. The difference is that the ectoparasites on the outside of the salmon pose a significant risk to other people's interests. Whereas if Alex has his cattle in the byre in winter and they have ticks or ringworm or whatever else they might have, uh, unless it's something really bad like food in the mouth, the, the risks to other people's interests in the environment is, is negligible. Uh, the, the risk of lousy fish in cages and sea loss in Scottish waters are a direct risk to other people's interests, and that's, that's the disconnect here between sea louse infestations and terrestrial louse infestations on, on terrestrial animals. And I, I, I take uh, and reiterate Alex's point that it's one of the few things in, in the Scottish <coughs> environment where someone can be doing something that can significantly impact on someone else's interests, and there is no public access to what's going on. In, in all the things that we regulate, smoking chimneys on factories, if you live downwind of that and you want to find out what's in that smoke, you can find out from, from us, from public record, published record. And it's the one, it's the one omission, I think, in, in, uh, in my view, in, in, in Scotland with regard to, to fish farming, that, that for all sorts of reasons ought to be, ought to be sorted out and, and ought to be published. Very good. We've got a number of people who want to come in on this, uh, so we'll just take them in a row. Ken Wellens, Jim Hume. And then Guy Lindley Adams. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just to preface my, remark, but my remarks, because I'm going to talk a little bit about the experience in Ireland, um, many of the farms that I'm talking about would also have sister farms here in Scotland. The situation in Ireland is that we have, for quite a number of years now, had public access to the, uh, to the lice information. And uh, the system in Ireland, the monitoring, uh, which in another life I was responsible for, my team used to monitor 14 times a year, then the material that was collected was analysed. Within two weeks, the farms were actually made aware of what the monitoring had showed. Within a month, the information is uh, made available publicly. There are actually huge advantages to this, and the point that Phil made earlier in terms of a lice strike, whatever its source, it does mean that if you're publishing the information, the full supports of the state can actually go into the areas where the problems are, rather than a situation where it might be spread out widely throughout the fish farming community. It has huge advantages in terms of identifying the areas where there are problems and finding solutions in those areas. And certainly um, in the context of the experience that I've had with that programme, it has worked very well, both in the context of the farming sector and in the context of the wild sector. And I would recommend that sort of approach to you. Thank you. Jim Hume? Yeah, it, it was really on, on Professor uh, Thomas's point about um, and the declared farming interest, uh, which, which still exists. Uh, we do have notifiable diseases that, that have to be notified to, uh, in agriculture already, with foot and mouth, sheep scab, brucellosis, tuberculosis. So my point really is, you know, how serious is <coughs> sea lice? I mean, uh, around this table, is it something that is extremely damaging to the wild fish and uh, therefore should be notifiable or, or not, because we do have plenty of examples of notifiable di diseases that uh, are, would do significant damage to other land-based industries. Thank you. I'm sure there will be people who want to come back on that, but uh, first of all, Guy Lindley um, adam Very quickly, I'd, I'd like to talk about the scale of, of uh, the lice problem in, in terms of the number of fish you get on a fish farm. Uh, a, a fish farm, and farmers here will correct me if I'm wrong, would be about 300,000 fish, an average fish farm. It takes a very low number of egg-producing lice on those fish to produce a very large number of juvenile lice outside the cages and into the wider sea environment that wouldn't be there from the wild fish. It's a, it's a question of scale. Um, uh, moving on, a quick point of clarification. The, the 2007 Act does require records to be kept by the industry, by the fish farms. They are available for inspection. They are not held by the Fish Health Inspectorate. They don't take copies, and that takes them outside the Environmental Information Scotland regulations. The public does not have access to them unless the Scottish Government or its agencies holds them. Um, and uh, finally, just picking up on what Douglas Sinclair of uh, SEPA said, um, and he knows this well, I use those environmental information regula uh, regulations on a fairly regular basis <coughs> against SEPA, and I can get access to the amount of organic detritus under fish farms. I can get access to information about sea lice chemical treatment residues in the sediments surrounding fish farms. Um, uh, 
the Fish Health Inspectorate, uh, Marine Scotland Science, puts records on about the number of fish that have escaped from fish farms on their website. The only piece of information I cannot get is how many avidurous lice are on the, far, on the fish in the fish farm concerned, and that is a surrogate for the number of juvenile lice that will be coming out from that fish farm into the wider environment. That's the gap that needs to be plugged. Okay, thank you. Uh, Claudia Beamish and then uh, Alex Adrian. Uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to pursue the issue of confidentiality in relation to fish farms uh, a bit further. Um, we've heard uh, about the example of Ireland in the evidence that we were uh, were given as a committee. We've heard about the situation in Norway, where I understand that disclosure is more more bold. And I would like to seek clarification on the reasons for um, the the need for confidentiality which, um, in my view, having only been on two visits and read the evidence, you know, as a layperson, I, I, I would argue at this stage would need to be balanced with any um, need for uh, public perception to be uh, taken into account. And, um, and I, I do have a concern about this. For instance, the, um, the Atlantic Salmon Trust has stated in their evidence um, that... Uh, uh, the bill does nothing to take forward the concept of disclosure, and it would seem to me that one of the reasons for this bill is, is accountability. So I would be very keen to hear from um, the producers about, about the confidentiality issue and related issues. Well, we'll bring in Professor uh, Thomas first of all. Well, if I can pick up some of the points that have been made and then, then come on to... Uh, well, you know, I yeah. think. Okay. Um, firstly, notifiable diseases. It's exactly the same situation uh, in, in fish farming. There are notifiable diseases in exactly the ways that there are in farming. The second point is to pick up on Douglas's point uh, about salmon farming or fish farming being different to terrestrial farming. That's not the case. Uh, ticks on one farm will affect ticks on the farm next door, as you, I suspect, uh, are aware. Uh, more importantly, perhaps, in terms of farming, uh, parasites on farm animals will affect humans because humans come in contact with those farm animals. Now, that's something that doesn't happen at all in relation to, to fish farming. So uh, to say that fish farming is peculiar and being uh, one particular uh, uh, industry that is different to the rest is, is simply not true. Uh, if you take the point that's been made about um, systems elsewhere, the Norwegian system, in fact, is exactly the, the uh, same arrangement uh, as, as exists in Scotland. The Norwegian, industry, the Norwegian industry publishes sea lice data on an area basis, the only difference being that, that in uh, Norway the data is collected by the industry and published through a public agency website. There is no difference otherwise in terms of the approach that's taken. In Norway, individual uh, farmers share sea lice data within individual farmers uh, groups, and that happens in Scotland too as part of the area management agreements. So there's a, a direct parallel. It is different, to pick up Ken's point, it is different from Ireland. Uh, in Ireland, the uh, frequency of counts on farms is much less frequent than in Scotland. And they are published, I think I'm right in, in recalling, they're published retrospectively uh, at the end of the year. Uh, now, the, the, the route we've taken in Scotland is to publish quarterly data, uh, and we will continue to do that, uh, and we will publish it on a much um, larger um, disaggregation so that it will be much finer areas, much smaller areas than we've been doing in the past. That, I have to say, uh, is not an issue for... Uh, it's not something that's been done for fish farming. It's been done specifically in relation to the, uh, the, the wild fish uh, interests. Right, Alex, like a, a point of, of, uh, clarification. It's um, every month that the data are, are uh, published publicly and they're available within two weeks. It's not every year. You've made that point. Okay. Thank you. Right. Alex, Adrian, please. And then, uh, yeah. I was just going to make right, the point about Ferguson. context here. Um, <coughs> the, be, be, this argument is being, is, is being undertaken on the basis that there are adjacent interests that may be affected by lice on, on fish farms. It is the context of just how those adjacent interests are being affected and the significance of that effect that is material here. So I would suggest that the publication of lice data is material to those whose interests are affected and the level at which those lice are being managed. So, for example, in a management area situation, it is entirely acceptable that a particular farm's 
lice counts would be made available to the interests that may be affected within that management area. If you're then looking at the performance of the management area as a whole, it may well be that the, the lice figures that relate to the, uh, the, the farms within that collective management area are more relevant simply because they will give an idea of how collectively that area is managing the, the significance of its effects. Um, I think the, the fact that someone who is entirely unaware of particular local contexts and significance, um, I would be interested to know why they feel they should be looking at or privy to individual farm life data. And I'll give you an example. If, for example, if there is a situation where a farm is managing to keep their lice levels just below an agreed threshold, um, or a farm that is managing to keep their lice levels almost to zero, but on two occasions or one occasion breaches that threshold, no one really knows, in my view, which there is the worst scenario, which has more effect on those local interests that may or may not be affected. But in one case you've had a breach, in the other case you haven't. That doesn't necessarily mean that those are directly related to the impacts that may emanate from that farm. And therefore, again, coming back to this, you know, life data is only relevant where the context is, 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 is appreciated. Outside that, I think you have to argue why it might get available. Um, George Farlow wanted in earlier, before I come back to Alec Ferguson with some more specifics. George Farlow. Convener, thank you. I just wanted to say that um, Highland Council does receive figures from Marine Scotland Science, and even where the numbers of sea lice are in and around the, the code of good practice, there still can be a significant impact on the environment, and I would say from a local authority point of view, the impact on the environment is specifically um, a planning issue that we would, we would like to talk about um, as soon as we could. Chair, thank you. Uh, Alex Kinnaman. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I, think, I think we can fully accept that, you know, this argument that sea lice are naturally occurring, but what we're interested in is the, the industry's management response to that. And it's important that we, we, we get a, a proper and objective view of, of sea lice levels on the, on the farm level. And I think that certainly the proposal that's been put forward by industry ne certainly needs further discussion through, uh, among stakeholders before we can accept that that really takes forward this openness, openness and transparency agenda, which we understood was, was one of the underpinning elements to the, the, the government's consultation on the bill and the package of measures alongside that. I think certainly in the evidence that this committee has received and the, the, the consultation responses that went in on the, on the bill, would seem to suggest that the weight of opinion is certainly that farm, access to farm level data in a raw or disaggregated form is the pre preferred way, is the preferred view. Certainly ours at Scottish Wildlife Trust through Scottish Environment Link and, and the, the, the uh, individual organisations that have endorsed that view, the Wild Fisheries Interest, SEPA, Association of Salmon Fishery Boards, I could go on, and, and many hi hi councils, including Highland Council, um, in, in the aquaculture zone. I think that aggregation of data can really mask issues at the local level. Um, and, and from our member, for, from the perspective of our members, it really fuels that speculation that there's something to hide in, in all of this. And I think that, that needs to be remembered. Okay, there will be a chance for other people to come in. We've got to keep moving along. There are some specifics on this, perhaps, that feed in from those remarks. Alec Ferguson. There are other things, obviously, I'd like to say, but yeah, I, will, sure. I will move on, convener, no, because I, I uh, uh, appreciate the need for, that we have some time pressure. But I wonder, it was mentioned early on, I think, by um, Councillor Farlow, the, the, uh, the, the question of biomass. Um, and I wonder, perhaps, if I could ask Douglas Sinclair to expand on, on just what powers are available to SEPA currently to deal with, with the biomass caused by, um, or on fish farms. Uh, how often these powers have been used? And how and when further powers uh, might be created to reduce biomass due to sea lice uh, infestation? Yes, we, we, we currently issue a license under the Control Activities Regulations for fish farms, and that license contains a range of limiting conditions designed to keep the discharges from the fish farm within the capacity of the environment. And we use a variety of models to set those limits 
uh, aiming to ensure that the environment out with the immediate vicinity of the fish farm is protected. And we use a range of models, as I say, certain models are used to set the biomass on the farm, so the amount of fish that can be kept on the farm, and different models are used to set the, the amount of chemicals that can be used to, to treat the fish. And this can give rise to a situation where, for example, the farmer can hold a thousand tonnes of fish on the farm, but may only have access to treat, to, to medicines of a sufficient quantity to treat, let's say, 800 of those thousand <coughs> tonnes. Now, there was a suggestion in the consultation for the bill that there be powers where we may be instructed to reduce the biomass in that circumstance to 800 tonnes, so the amount of biomass that can be treated with the medicines that are available. Uh, we're certainly open to that. Uh, indeed, the, the, the provision doesn't appear in the bill because the ministers probably have that capability under the ability to give us a direction to reduce biomass. We generally have never taken that step to reduce biomass in that way because we would anticipate that farmers ought to keep farms at a level of stock that they can treat with the medicines that are available to them, because that would be good husbandry. And we felt that straying into to the realms of dealing with biomass in relation to lice is, is, is fish health matters which aren't business for sheep to, to attend to. So, so those are the reasons why we, we generally haven't reduced biomass for, for reasons of, of sea lice management, let's say. We do reduce biomass for other reasons, uh, for example, where the level of impact on the seabed is unacceptable at a fish farm. Uh, we may reduce biomass on farms of that type. A small number per year, perhaps between five and ten per year, uh, would, would fall into that sort of category. But we don't generally do this for, for reasons of sea lice management. Can I, can I just further that? Uh, uh, and this is, uh, Claudia Beamish described herself as a lay person. I very much fit into that category on this particular issue. Um, is, there, is there a power currently to revoke fish farm licences? If not, do you think there should be? And if so, under what circumstances do you think it should be applied? SIBA has powers to revoke any car licence, uh, and the most usual reason for that would be where environmental impacts are beyond the sort of sustainable limits that we've imposed. So in the context of fish farming, if this seabed was in a very bad condition, was badly damaged, there was, there was evidence of, let's say, nutrient enrichment in the sea loch that was causing algal blooms, something like that, then we may consider that we would need to revoke a fish farm site. It's not something that we do very often, if at all. We would normally seek to reduce the level of impact, so reduce the level of production of the farm, to find a sustainable level, because m most farms can be operated sustainably at a certain level. It, it, it's, it's a question of finding the right level. Normally, the models that we use are reasonably accurate, or, uh, as far as computer models are concerned, <laughs> but the environment is a, a living entity. It's, it's very variable, so sometimes the models don't fit the environment, and we find ourselves needing to reduce the biomass on a fish farm, and, th and that happens on a small number of occasions each year. Uh, Steve Bracken on that point. <coughs> I think it's important to stress that from a, a farming point of view, no farmer wants to have lice on their fish, and they will do everything they can to control the numbers that they've got. The, the reason for that is, ultimately, fish can die from, from, from lice. We don't want that, of course, but the fish can be just their health can be impaired generally. And again, we don't want that. So control is, is paramount. Uh, the second point I'd just like to make on the reduction in consents, uh, this is something that we take extremely seriously. It's a bit like uh, a supermarket being told that they're going to lose their delicatessen, they're going to lose the meat counter, the veg counter, and let's see how you get on and running your business. So for us to have a reduction in consent, we don't want that because obviously we'd be producing fewer tonnes from that farm. So it's critical that we manage the farm in a way that we can keep our consent matching the tonnage and looking at the environment at the same time to ensure that there's no detriment. Thank you. Um, Alec Ferguson, OK with that? Yes, Could I just make one yes. brief observation? Because the, the, the analogy was made between um, agriculture and aquaculture and the differences that we were talking about earlier on. I think there is a big difference in that if a diseased animal escapes from a farm, it can be rounded up with the neighbouring animals and any other animals in which it's come into contact and appropriate action can be taken. I don't think that's the case with escapees from fish farms. And I think that is a significant difference when we're discussing this type of issue. And briefly on this point, Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Gavina. I'm not really sure that I've had an answer that I can understand about the confidentiality issue, and I really am going to press this. I really would like to hear from the association and from uh, others present about the reasons for the need for confidentiality uh, in view of the points I made before. Thank you. 
bill. Well, I can only because respond as I've responded before. I don't think, I mean, the, the uh, suggestion there is that the data is confidential. It is not confidential. All data on all farms is available to the fish health inspectors at all times. Indeed, it's, it's a legal offence for um, a fish health inspector to be uh, prevented in any way at all from getting access to the data. Uh, and that is exactly the same as any other uh, industry. Um, the degree of publication of information uh, in terms of things like uh, the uh, practices on fish farms, we have published the uh, Code of Good Practice uh, uh, reports every year. Uh, it's not that in any way at all that the industry is doing anything or indeed wishing anything that doesn't apply to, to any other industry. It's exactly the same situation. So um, it is difficult to see why, you should, why there should be an exception in terms of fish farming. And uh, 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 in response to Alex's points about escapes, I mean, there is a kind of an assumption there that, that you have fish with disease that are escaping. I mean, that's an assumption that, that um, is very difficult to support in any sense at all. Uh, you know, the, the fish that are on fish farms, if they are diseased, will be treated on fish farms. Um, the levels of escapes are not as low as we would like, but they are incredibly low already. Uh, I mean, they, they are a very low figure and have come down over the years. Uh, and that uh, pattern will get greater, you know, that, that there'll be fewer escapes. So I, I don't see the basis of the risk concern that you have for escape fish. I mean, the, the numbers just simply don't support that. Right, very brief remarks on this. We've got a lot of questions and we don't want to shorten the winter, but we do like to get through them this morning. So Alan Wells, first of all, please. The, the discussion and the representations that came through the consultation and have come to the committee are about the publication of data. And the SSPO have said that they don't want to publish farm level data because of reasons of commercial confidentiality. And I don't think that's the question, I don't think that's actually been answered. If I can just give you an idea of why I think it is important to, to publish at a local level, because it also allows the industry to, uh, to uh, demonstrate their management response. So when you do have a problem, no matter where that problem's come from, whether it's come from wild fish or whether it's come from you know, cross-infection between farms in an area, the industry is then able, at a local individual level, to demonstrate how they've responded and take an action on that basis. Okay. If you look at the data that's on the SSPO website just at the moment, if you look at the North Mainland, um, which is the, one of the six areas, you'll see that across that entire area, for the whole of the month of, uh, of June, sea lice levels were 458% above the treatment threshold level. Okay, now you can look at that in a few ways. You could, you could decide that all farms within that area are 458% above the level. I don't believe that's the case. What I would believe is the case is that two or three farms have really serious problems with sea lice. And I think it's entirely within the public interest to understand where those problems are and understand that those problems are being dealt with. Well, we've heard the arguments about having perhaps measurements in 26 areas already. So we've heard that particular piece of evidence. Uh, Steve Bracken and Professor Richards on this point. Yeah, just to say that uh, in terms of confidentiality, uh, we have on our Marine Harvest website our sea lice uh, numbers published. And so we've been doing that since uh, 2009. So it's not confidential. Thank you. And Professor Richard. I was going to make the point that, in fact, in um, all these farm sites, there's very strict veterinary control of what goes on. And also through the workings of the uh, Healthier Fish Working Group, we were asked to come forward with uh, a level of mortality which required notifying to uh, Marine Scotland, and this is done. So that Marine Scotland independently can also investigate the cause of an increase in mortality to see if there's anything serious happening, whatever the cause, or if there's a new problem developing. So this is, this is very clearly um, set out in the workings of that group and followed by the industry. Thank you very much. I think we'll move on to the overall approach to regulation in fish farms. Uh, bring in Graham Day. Yeah, good morning, thank you. Um, <coughs> looking at the, the general picture, is fish farming in Scotland subjected currently to a more, more or less stringent regulatory regime than fish farming in other countries? And what are the effects of regulation on the competitiveness of the in industry? Phil Thomas. 
I have to start by explaining why fish farming in Scotland is different. Um, Scotland is, is disadvantaged in a way in relation to its ability uh, to, to fish farm in as much as we have relatively small sites. Um, for example, our sites can, cannot be as big as they would be in Norway. Uh, we have a situation where our cost base tends to be higher because of the scale of the site. And that's offset, frankly, uh, by the industry having over quite a number of years done a very good job at, at placing Scottish farm salmon at, as the premium product in the world market. So, in effect, we balance off higher costs uh, 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 against the better price that we get for, for salmon worldwide. If you do the comparisons in terms of the uh, regulations around the world, uh, I think you could take probably the major competitors, um, I would say at the moment, um, would be Norway, uh, Chile, uh, and North America, uh, including Canada. Uh, as far as Norway is concerned, the regulations in Norway are different. Uh, many people would argue that they are much easier to operate under. Uh, in particular, for example, Norway has a much more progressive regime in relation to licensing new medicines and so on. Um, and that's difficult for us because sometimes uh, you have a, a situation where the Norwegian industry will get access to a new medicine a number of years before it would appear in Scotland. Uh, and that's partly regulatory, not, not entirely Scottish regulation, some of that's EU regulation, but it does make it that bit more difficult. Um, if you go to Chile, um, I would need to be careful what I, uh, I said, I guess, or how I said it. Um, in Chile, the regulations uh, are much less restrictive than they are in Scotland. Uh, and Chile will be always one of the lowest cost producers in the world, by definition. Um, in any market where Scotland would compete with Chile, we would only ever compete for the 1 or 2% in the premium part of the market because we couldn't produce... Uh, commodity salmon that, that would uh, compete. Uh, in regard to North America, it varies a little bit from region to region. Um, I would say overall in North America on things like medicines, we are quite reasonably well placed. They have a less, um, uh, a, a shorter list of medicines to use than we have. Um, they have some other uh, operations that are actually rather more flexible than, than, than uh, we have in terms of new development. And in particular, uh, I would say um, they do rather well at the moment because there is a national plan in uh, Canada in particular to develop fish market farming. And therefore, the government is being very supportive in particular regions in covering costs of new farms, actually providing investment grants for people coming in, and so on and so forth. Uh, I suppose the only other one I should mention is probably Ireland. Um, and in Ireland, it's been a, an interesting uh, situation. Ireland has stagnated for a number of years. Ken could uh, comment uh, probably rather better than I. Stagnated for a number of years. The Irish government is presently making government investments to develop government farms that would actually free up the development of the industry. And the final point I'll make, and then I'll, I'll be quiet, uh, you might ask, well, why is there... Uh, all this activity, all this investment in relation to aquaculture. And, and the reason is very simple. If you look at the food security situation by 2030, you will not balance world food supply, uh, supplies without further development of aquaculture. You will have a protein gap that simply can't be met. Right, okay. Uh, okay. Anyone else want to come in on that? George Farlow. Douglas. Um, one of the, the Haring Council is very supportive of uh, the Scottish Government's uh, expansion plans to 50% of increment. So that, that would be, um, we would support that indeed. It's in our Council programme. Uh, but we recognise that there are environmental um, difficulties with that at times. Um, we we would like to look at how, for, for example, with uh, onshore wind farms, we, the Highland Council produces um, supplementary guidances with that. That encourages um, developers to actually know the framework within which we were working. There is a, um, a wish, I think, an aspiration in Highland Council that we might 
we, we might like to produce supplementary guidance for, for um, the industry so that to encourage, um, f what shall I say, um, um, efficient and effective movement towards uh, the, the giving of planning where appropriate to the industry to encourage them to increase that, to increase the speed of that expansion and uh, so that with, um, if the industry does come to the Highland Council with um, pre-application pre um, uh, for pre-application advice and responses, that would be very useful and we would be keen to do that. I believe, um, certainly, if, if the officers aren't keen, the members are keen. Indeed. <laughs> uh, Douglas Sinclair. <laughs> So I, guess, I guess it's one of the regulators I should, should try and respond, and uh, I, I, don't, I, don't have much, I don't have much disagreement, actually, with what Phil has uh, said. I think that you know, when I've looked at the situation in, in, let's say, the developed countries between Canada, Norway, Scotland, and even Chile slated to one side, uh, I think it's a curate's egg thing. You know, all are probably good in parts. I think there's certain things that we do or have to do in Scotland that cause the industry problem, and I think Phil touched on, for example, access to medicines, which is more complex in Scotland as a member of the EU than it is in Norway, as uh, someone who signed up to parts of EU treaties. Uh, and, uh, but overall, I think when you look at complexity, costs, the number of regulations, there isn't much to separate <coughs> developed countries. Um, there was a com comparative cost study done a few years ago which looked at Canada, Scotland and Norway, and I think put us in the middle in terms of cost per tonne production. Um, so I, I, I think we do quite a good job, and I don't just mean SEPA, but I mean I think for regulation in Scotland there's quite a good job. Uh, it's necessarily restrictive in parts because that's the nature of regulation, but I think it also uh, contributes then to the premium that Phil's members enjoy in terms of the value because people who buy the salmon believe that they're buying something from a, from a good, clean environment that's well looked after. So, Thank you. Um, Alec Kinnaman. Thanks, I mean, uh, less a point on the regulation, more a sort of response to some of the comments by Professor Thomas uh, and Councillor Farlow there. Um, uh, uh, Professor Thomas raised the, the point of uh, premium quality and really um, that, in, in a sense, I guess Scotland isn't the best place on, in the world to, to, to do salmon farming in terms of the costs and, and, and the sizes, the, the reasons you mentioned. But it really, um, and I think our kind of support of the industry really has to be on the basis that it can be encouraged within the carrying capacity of the environment and the, and the, the, the growth uh, figures quoted by Councillor Fallow and, and supported as far as I am aware by, by the Scottish Government I don't think really take into account the carrying capacity of, of, of the environment I think that's something that really needs to be taken taken on board um, and really that growth can only really happen in to the extent that it's not detrimental to other users of the environment as well, such as shellfish cultivation or tourism operators, that are all quite important. So um, there was another point made about um, food security, and I, I don't think anybody should be under the illusion that Scottish salmon is going to feed 7 billion mouths. I, I think that's, that's a it's not a, a great argument to go down. And what we can be is a world leader in sustainable production, and we can you know, be a knowledge base for sustainable practices. And really selling on that brand, that, that brand of Scotland's environment and um, that, that, you know, fantastic produce from a healthy, clean environment. You know, healthy seas and coasts are hugely important to the people of Scotland. You know, wild salmon in our rivers, equally important. And I think we really need to retain that if we're to go forward with the industry. As you can understand, we'll be asking a lot of different people these questions in due course beyond this panel. Um, as we need to move on with this and may be able to come back in. Uh, Graham Day. Okay, uh, two further questions. Three. What proportion of the fish farming industry is signed up to the Code of Good Practice? And what do the inspection regime show about the levels of compliance? Yeah, Phil Thomas. Um, very simply, 98% is the answer. Um, and the reason for that is that 98% of production is with it within the SSPO, and you can't be an SSPO member unless you sign up the Code of Good Practice. So um, it's, it's, it's a, almost a quasi-statutory situation. Uh, in terms of compliance, the compliance levels are very high. Uh, and, and I could uh, quote you that they are all in the high 90s. Um, the main area where there is non-compliance, as in every single food industry that, that uh, uh, you have in the UK and indeed elsewhere, 
is where there is a change in regulations in particular, uh, which involves changes in record keeping, it normally takes about 12 months for the industry to fully implement catching up with the record keeping. So if there's a change in regulation that requires differences in record keeping, you, you will find that in that record keeping component, there'll be an increased non-compliance, still small, but an increased non-compliance, and that disappears within 12 months as people catch up and get their record systems in place. Okay. Any other views on that? Yes, Professor. I believe the industry is um, severely audited by a vast number of different organisations, uh, particularly including the supermarkets, who, who insist on a higher standard than that is present in normal legislation. So um, I think probably more regulated than any other production industry. Steve, you're probably talking. Yes, we, uh, we had a look just recently at the end of uh, November uh, to look at the, the number of audits that we've had in marine harvest this year. We've had 270 audits this year, and we've got, uh, we've got more to come. And that is over 14 different schemes and organisations. So in a, that's in addition to the, to the Code of Good Practice, of course. Okay. I think we've covered that then. Uh, my final question, uh, Chair, is uh, would it have been possible to introduce the measures in the bill through a statutory code of practice or for the industry code to be amended to reflect this? What <coughs> approach would have been the best one to take? Okay. Well, um, just on the, on, the, on the point of farm specific sea lice data, if that's part of your question, that can be easily done with amending the record keeping order drawn under the 2007 Act. It doesn't need primary legislation. Okay, thank you. Phil Thomas. Specifically on, on statutory codes as against uh, industry codes, the difficulty with statutory codes is they ossify. The advantage of having an industry code <laughs> is the code can be revised to take account of best practice and new developments very quickly. So in fact, the um, reason, uh, and I should take uh, exception to the point that was made earlier, uh, it's not that um, Scotland is seeking to have uh, a world-class sustainable industry, it already has one. Um, so we have a situation where that industry standard has been driven up over the years by the Code of Good Practice. Uh, and, and that's the reason why the code of good practice really needs to be led by the industry, albeit uh, Scottish Government then selects out of that code the elements of the code that they need to build into their own regulatory inspection regime. <coughs> okay, we will be moving on to fish farm management uh, with Claudia Beamish. Uh, right, just uh, convener, I just had a quick supplementary on that, on okay. that point. Um, it was just really to bring in um, Highland Council specifically uh, in view of the evidence that was given. Um, and I wonder if, um, uh, Councillor, you'd be able to comment any further on the fact that uh, from your evidence or from the evidence of your council, it said that it was disappointing that a number of the proposals set out in the consultation have not been carried forward in the bill. And I just wondered, in the context of the discussions we've had so That's far... That's not a small comment. point. <laughs> Sorry? That's not a small point. Okay. Councillor Farlow. Thank you, convener. Um, what, one of the issues that we did have um, goes on to the fish, fish farm management area. I'm going to come on to that, so, yes. to the convener, if we can leave that until we come to that point. Yes, but um, as, as I mentioned before, the actual environment of, of a sea loch is hugely of huge concern to residents in Highland Council, and it's been mentioned before how we would like, as uh, Alex Kinnemouth says about pristine locks, and you know there is a huge uh, um, difficulty with, uh, as as he points out, to expand 50 at the rate as the Scottish government has suggested. What we would, we would like to see is how this is managed, and the, this refers to issues about crown est, old Crown Estate licence, unused, um, unused um, licences, and things, things like that, that there are plenty of scope um, for advancement of the industry, um, certainly within any guidance that uh, the Highland Council would do. But we're just wondering where, where we were with that, um, if those um, convener, I don't, I'm not 
criticising anybody in particular, but if, if companies take a dog in a manger attitude to, prote to prevent um, expansion of the industry in, in the interests of uh, jobs and economic growth in remote and rural areas, which it is, that we, we would like to see that changed. Um, this takes us back to discussions that were had with the 2007 Act and uh, the degree of uh, sites which were owned by people but not used. And uh, it uh, is something which I myself um, questioned at the time and to some extent doesn't sound as though it's <coughs> changed. Um, I wonder if uh, we can come back to that in uh, the wrap-up perhaps, but fish farm management as such perhaps would be able to encompass some of that, and Claudia Beamish does have some questions there. Thank you, convener. Um, I think, I hope panellists will agree with me that it's helpful to ask the, the range of questions so that we can open up this, this area of discussion, um, as, as was the case with the questions put by um, my colleague Nigel Don. And it is particularly about um, the fish farm management agreements and statements, and I wonder if firstly, um, anyone, anyone can clarify for us the difference between them and what proportion of fish farms are not part of such agreements and what problems this does pose or might pose. What do panellists think about the requirements of the Code of Good Practice on the preparation of agreements and statements which a bill will require all fish farms to follow and very importantly um, from our perspective as a committee to try to understand who should be involved in the production of area management statements or agreements and how are the areas <coughs> covered by agreements delineated. So I hope that opens up this subject in a way that is useful to panellists. Okay, uh, who wants to kick off? Alex, Adrian, yes, you were responsible, I think, your organisation for uh, <laughs> many of these licences. Yeah. That, that um, I'll, I'll tackle the management agreement uh, matter first. I mean, as I indicated earlier, we think this is the key feature of the bill, and, and, and local management is, is, is a key element in both managing the interactions between uh, farms and between farms and adjacent interests such as wild fisheries. I think, effectively, that piece of legislation is it, it, trying, trying to manage relationships because good management agreements are based upon good relationships, and it's very hard to legislate for relationships. However, what this can do is it can advocate and bring to legislation the fact that people have to engage, and that's the starting point. Um, the two things, one is there has to be a degree of, of, of pragmatism um, on the part of both farmers and wildfish as to where these areas sit, how they sit, addressing correct biological connectivity. So where they do not draw lines simply for um, commercial or other reasons, they need to reflect proper biological connectivity and where they are discrete from other areas. That's one important point. The second is that in terms of what is included, I think the bill has, has, has set out the sort of broad scale framework of what is there. But I would leave it to the people who are then constitute the, 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 the members of that management agreement to decide exactly how it is managed. There's no point in any national prescription of how you manage local circumstances. That's the point of local management agreements. It is down to the, uh, to the, to the participants in those agreements how they advocate it. I think it, it's fair to have some guidance on what you might expect, the reporting of uh, performance and um, even with regard to the fact that you would like to see, um, for example, locally set treatment thresholds or um, the uh, or following or, or, or any kind of regime like that, just how these have actually been addressed, whether or not how, how they manifest themselves will be particular to that, that particular area. But I think in, the, in terms of being seen or having it seen that they are addressed is, is fair from a, from a sort of a framework point of view. Um, the last point I'd, I'd, I'd like to make on this is, is the, the fact that if you can get the, the farmers, and these are essentially farm management agreements that are between different farm areas, once you can start to have the industry demonstrate that it can live happily side by side, that there is no influence on one, well, by one farm on another farm, it will, you will start to be able to demonstrate that there is a reduced uh, potential for any, effect, for any uh, effect on adjacent interests as well. 
So to my mind, these farm management agreements address two things. They address farmers sitting side by side, and they address both farmers and wild fish interests sitting side by side. Um, what are the, one very last point, there is precedent for this. Um, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we had the tripartite working group out of which came area management agreements. Many of these are still in place, and many of them are still working extremely effectively. So I think this is not, this, we're not reinventing the wheel here. I think it's just a case of bringing everybody into the fold. Thank you. Uh, Alan Wells. A lot of what, what Alex said here. Uh, just th there are a couple of aspects of this which are, are, are slightly confusing. So uh, a person who carries out a business of fish farming at a fish farm located within a farm management area must do various things. But there's not actually any duty to farm within a farm management area. Now, I believe that would be covered by the code, but uh, you know, I would like to see some sort of uh, um, thinking uh, you know, uh, along those lines. And I think there's, there, there's also s a, s a, some confusion as to the sort of hierarchy between a farm management agreement and a farm management statement. Now, my understanding is that a farm management agreement is where there is more than one operator within a, an area, and they agree how, 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 how that, uh, that is organised. And a farm management statement is when you've got an area with only one operator working. But I think that it's not necessarily clear that um, sometimes there may be a farm management statement where there are more than one operator if they can't reach agreement on, a, on an agreement. And I think I would be looking for more clarity for that, that particular point of view because I think when I came into this, I thought, well, it's either an agreement if there's more than one operator or it's a statement if there's just one. But there does seem to be a little bit of dubiety just in the, on, on the outskirts of that. Can you uh, dispel the dubiety, Phil Thomas? Uh, yes. um, first, simply on the statistics, the point that, that Claudia Beamish raised. Uh, as far as I'm aware, there are, uh, well, in, in production terms, there's 2% of people outside the PO. Everybody in the PO is working under a farm management area, farm management agreement. Uh, I think at the last count, there were two farms, uh, two <coughs> independent farms who were not in the PO, uh, both of which are placed in distant areas of the country, if I can put it that way, and, and these are, were on the tips of islands. Um, they don't formally operate under a farm management uh, statement situation because they're single farms in particular areas, but they actually do abide by what the PO requests on that. Um, to deal with the detail, the way that farm management um, areas are determined does take into account the um, bay areas, for example, that the farms are in. So all the, those hydrographic uh, factors are taken into account. But it also has to take into account things like biosecurity requirements in relation to vessel movements. So you do have a situation where you're looking at a number of separate factors coming into the um, farm management uh, area designation. Um, in, in essence, in a very simple way, um, if you have farm management areas that are too big, then they become unmanageable. And this is one of the reasons why Chile has such uh, enormous problems. Because Chile has a formal government-driven uh, farm management area system, but the areas are far too big, and that's problematic. Uh, Norway uh, hasn't historically had a farm management area system. It's now basing its system on Scotland, uh, but within these four walls, and this is not recorded in inverted commas, uh, my judgment would be that, that Norway is making exactly the same mistakes as Chile, that they're making the areas so big that they're unmanageable. Uh, so there is a dimension there. As far as the agreements are concerned, you, you have to recognise that the agreements are by nature a plan, because what you're saying is two companies are going to, well, two or more companies are going to work together uh, and as circumstances change, as management change, they might need to adjust what they do, but they would adjust it in concert, so it's an active process that is going on there. Uh, in clarification of the farm management statements, the farm management statements were introduced, I think, from memory about four years ago now, and they were done very specifically uh, for a specific purpose. We have a number of, as it happens, relatively small uh, producer companies who were operating in particular areas. And we get, became very concerned about the notion that if somebody else established themselves in that area, they might want to manage the area differently to the way that the area is currently being managed. And the reason the farm management statements were put in was so that the companies who were already there could put down a marker and say, this is the way that this area is managed. 
Essentially, if you want to come into this area and develop, you will need to fit in with the area management uh, system that is in place or alternatively negotiate where there would be changes. So that was the reason for that. Um, and the final point is on the bill itself. Uh, I have to say that the, the section of the bill that deals with this has a number of uh, uh, errors in, in inverted commas. There are one or two factual mistakes and there are some points of detail that, that uh, simply are, are incorrect in terms of the operation of the system. We've raised these with the uh, bill team and we're hopeful that they will address these as, as the, the bill moves through to stage two. So we should have that in the evidence. Um, George Farlow and then Alex Adrian. Thank you. Thank you, convener. If, if I may say on the... Uh, our wish would be for a whole log for... Um, <laughs> Farming, fish farming, or sorry, a whole loch management area or a complex of lochs um, so that all of the users of that loch would be able to input in public to, to see where the, the planning uh, would go. Because I think the old saw is if, uh, if you fail to plan, you, <laughs> you plan to fail. So um, with that, we would look at and we'd like to... Um, carry on with our input into, for instance, the Pentland Firth and Orkney Waters Marine Spatial Plan that uh, Marine Scotland has uh, commenced, and they have found that our expertise in terrestrial planning is extremely useful when it comes to engaging with all um, users in the Pentland Firth, and you can understand that there are some dangerous users of the Pentland Firth and Orkney Waters, and there are some very um, relax people there who carry on their business without incurring environmental damage and I think convener knows who I'm referring to. Um, however, um, we would like to work that um, all the way around the Highland area and can I say about Highland Council area, it's a 85% it's a of the people in Highland live within five kilometres of the coast. So it's hugely important for us. And I think that one of the figures I also remember is that 50% 50, 50 of Scotland territory is, is the marine environment. So we're hugely aware of the, the significance of planning in, in marine waters in and around our coast, particularly for um, the industries that are bound to raise the hackles. If you wanted to fill um, a room in Alupool, if you've got fish farming and onshore wind um, discussions going, you would fill, the, fill Hamden Park, I can tell you that. So those are huge issues for all the members in Highland Council. And we would wish that the, the, our aspirations for a whole loch or a whole complex of lochs come under that. Within that, um, that would also, incidentally, um, Bill Thomas, that would encourage or discourage um, uh, scrutiny of the commercial uh, production of figures for one particular um, fish farm because I think you could take a holistic view of, of the area. Now, there are many other people who would be using that law and we would like to see that as the basis and maybe there could be a, a certain um, as we've had experience where we've um, had discussions with Argyle and Butte Council about where the, the lochs cross border it would be daft if we had one regime for <laughs> Highland Council and not, and not agree with our colleagues across the border. Thank you, Alex. Adrian. Um, just on the on the statements and agreements, yes, I mean, as, as Phil has described, our interpretation is that a statement describes effectively an area that has one farming incumbent and at the point at which another separate company may come in, they would then agree to adhere by the terms of the statement, at which point it stops being a statement becomes an agreement. That was certainly our interpretation. I think just on, 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 the, on, on area management, though, one important point is that, as the councillor said, you want to have these, these areas set out. It will be down to uh, 
filling knowledge gaps on, on, to, on hydrography and marine topography as to exactly where the biological connectivity is and isn't, and also obviously in relation to the farms. There is, a, there is one important element here that I would say relates to the regulation. Everybody, I think, recognises that a well-run area ma management area would incorporate things like a synchronous fallow of all the farms within that area. Now, I don't think there's any farmers who will dispute the fact that that makes a significant difference uh, to, the, to their ability to control lice and to retain the, effective, the effectiveness of uh, treatment compounds. However, in order to do that, they will need farms elsewhere to maintain their production. And therefore, that brings into, into play the strategic nature of area management agreements with regard to planning, such that a particular planning proposal in one area may not just necessarily have effects and impacts to be considered in that area, but then the development of that farm may in fact have material benefits in another area. So where a particular development may allow a synchronous fallow to be undertaken elsewhere, there is a net strategic benefit to that development. And I think that's something that, developer, that uh, regulators will need to bear in mind. It's not just the farm itself. It is its wider impact in what you might call the strategic management of that operation that is very important and will be key to making this area management principle work. We have a lot of questions uh, still to come to, but uh, on this point, Alec Kinnaman, followed by Margaret McDougall and then Alec Ferguson to wind up if we've not got any more responses. Uh, so, Alec Kinnanman first. Thanks, Convener. I'll, I'll try and be brief. It's my understanding that, you know, farm management agreements and statements uh, should, you know, are undertaken to coordinate activities within that area. And I think that, you know, I'm not sure that having the, um, a farm management statement as opposed to agreement really promotes that coordination. And it could certainly, it would seem to undermine efforts to coordinate within that agreement. So, um, they seem to be presented as a kind of equal, on an equal footing in the bill, and, and, and perhaps they, that, that should be looked at. Um, but I think, uh, as well as Councillor Fowler's points as well, I think in the interest of openness and transparency, you know, these agreements and statements should be publicly available and would certainly benefit <laughs> from participation of stakeholder groups with an interest in, in, in that uh, marine environment, and certainly in the wild salmonids and the environment or any other activities that take place in it. So I'd support that, that view. Thank you. Um, um, Margaret McDougall. Thank you, convener, and good morning, gentlemen. Um, obviously and understandably, the fish farms that are mostly around a uh, salmon fish. If I could perhaps widen out and um, section 1.2, the, the mention is the requirement for a marine finfish cultivation site to be party to a farm management agreement or statement, and that may have little relevance to uh, that business, but it would have an impact and add a burden uh, to that sector. C could you perhaps um, tell me what you think about a mediation mechanism between parties uh, and when that should be used? And also, could it be um, differing requirements of cultivating or certified organic standards from those of conventional farms, which when their contentious uh, issues arise. Anyone want to pick up those points? Particularly, Bill Thomas. I, I'm, I'm happy to chip in. In the um, difficulty you have is that that you, you in in the industry's view, um, uh, which is the view I would support, is you have to have farm management areas to allow you to get coordination between farms. Um, there is a piece of valid debate that says, um, should these be related to particular fish species or not? Um, and there is a particular issue, for instance, in relation to salmon and trout coming together because of some of the disease uh, uh, issues that will be shared. You could argue that if you were going to farm cod, which we don't at the moment, um, then the requirements for some of the farm management agreements might be quite different, but you would still need a farm management agreement. In relation to uh, organic farming, um, I am not aware of any area at all or any um, farm management uh, agreement at all that has a problem in relation to organic production. Uh, we have a number of producers in the PO who produce both organic and non-organic uh, salmon, for example. 
Um, there is one producer who is not a PO producer, uh, I think from memory, who produces organic salmon independently, quite, quite a small producer, but they're in a, a particular area um, where there are no other farms around, so it, the, the issues never arise. But, but within farm management agreements, there are no difficulties in, in uh, the, the two cups of production system. In terms of um, uh, kind of um, restitution, I think was the term he used, I mean, the, the whole basis of a farm management agreement is that you get people within an area to cooperate in a way that avoids the possibility that they will, will in any way at all interfere or damage with the other's business. What you're doing, in effect, to pick up on the, the, the point that uh, Councillor Fowler was making, is you're taking an area and you're managing an area between a set of companies. So they are all within that area operating to the same regime, in effect. So the issue, um, uh, as far as I'm aware, has never arisen. Okay. Alec Ferguson, do you have any points? To, yeah, just to one point. Yep, one point please. I would like to put on on the specific yep. um, subject, convener. Thank you. Um, I just wondered if anybody would like to comment on the possibility of, um, in the interests of openness and transparency, the details of FMAs and FMSs being made publicly available on a, for instance, a register. Does anybody think that's a good idea, or, or perhaps a bad idea? Well, so you hog this conversation. Um, and these are live documents. These are, these are documents that will change on a very regular basis, depending on, on what the farms are doing in terms of varying their production cycles and, and so on. So, um, you know, fish farming is not a nationalised industry, I have to tell you, and, and I'm beginning to doubt that at the moment in terms of some of the comments that are on the table. Uh, but you do have to have a system where you can have companies operating and operating closely together to manage areas. Um, I wouldn't see any benefit from that at all, and I would see an additional cost and a burden to companies in doing it. Simple as that. Can I, just I, I hope I can be forgiven for asking questions that we need to know as surely, members of the committee, surely. simply to tease out the issues yes. that other people put to us. I think that's what we're here for. Yeah, indeed we are. Thank you. Um, Steve Bracken, when we were looking at Loch Linney, we talked about the fact that there are, say, 17 fish farms between uh, the head of the loch and uh, the sea. Um, something like that. Can you remind us a little bit about the detail of that, because it might help Alec Ferguson. Yeah, we've, it, it wasn't as many as 17. <coughs> no, no. no, we've got, um, in Loch Linney, we have four farms. must have been the wind, I couldn't hear you speaking properly at that point. Probably was. Yeah, we, we've got four farms uh, in Loch Linney, and then yeah. further south we've got Scottish Sea Farms who have a presence there. Mm -hmm. So it's important that we work together, yeah. uh, that, that we exchange information about when we're going to, to sea lice treat, for example. All of that is, is, is key in us both producing top quality fish. And, and that, that's the way we have to, to operate as an industry. There's no, no question. You need to have these area management agreements, okay. uh, agreements between companies which will uh, share information, basically, on what you're doing and when you're doing it. Thank you for that. Um, Guy Lindley adams finally on this point. Uh, on the point uh, uh, as to whether these agreements should be on public register or not, um, it, it, I would suggest that it depends on what these agreements are about. If these agreements are about um, on-farm activities within, if you like, the black box of the farm, and it's about what's contained within the farm and stays within the farm, there, there's no need, I would say, for anything to be on a register. But the moment those agreements have an effect on what goes out into the wider environment uh, where other interest groups, wild fish interest groups included, uh, are, are, have an interest, have a legitimate public interest, then of course there is a, uh, there's, a, there's a need for those agreements to be in the public domain. That takes us... <coughs> Margaret McDougall. You know, I just feel I didn't get an answer to my question on mediation and the requirement for uh, a mediation mechanism. And I'm just looking for some clarity on that. Do you, does the, the panel feel that there is no need for uh, a mediation mechanism and everyone is going to sign up to these agreements and everything will be honky-dory? Bill Jim, Thomas. Jim, can you come back on it? Um, if I wasn't clear, I must apologise. Um, the, the position is with, with farm management agreements 
uh, there is often uh, mediation, if, if you want to put it that way, facilitation, which is provided by the, uh, from the PO. I mean, one of the, the basis of, of having a statutory PO uh, is that this allows companies to get together and share information in a way that allows these things to, to, to be facilitated. Um, the, the situation that arises, and, and, and this in part explains the farm management statement uh, position that they made earlier, the position that arises that, that historically has been tricky was where you have a company, uh, very often um, a new producer coming in and buying up existing fish farms. And, and therefore, all of a sudden, you find that you have uh, an area where you say have two companies operating, one of the company's ownership <coughs> changes, and that company wants to do something slightly different. Uh, now, when that happens, you do genuinely... Uh, have a situation where there is a need, whether one would call it mediation, I, I would debate maybe, but, but certainly in terms of facilitation. Uh, and um, again, that's provided through the PO, not necessarily by us directly, but we bring people in. If I can take a particular example, um, we, we had one area in Shetland, which actually is a very big area, it's, it's the area around St. Magnus Bay where our perception uh, was that, that we needed to expand the farm management area and get an agreement uh, over a bigger area. And it was an area where there were three companies involved. And the way that we approached that, because they all had slightly different systems, the way that we approached that was to get the companies to agree to operate through a single independent veterinary advisor who was, in effect, advising all three companies from the one advisor, and that allowed them over a period of about 18 months to bring their systems into line so it could be managed as a single area. So that process does take place already, and if I wasn't clear on that, I should apologise. Thank, Thank you for that point. Um, we are very short of time at the moment, and there will be a chance for other people to come in perhaps on some... Is this a quick question? I'm convenient. Is it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener. Um, it's simply just wondering if there should be a fallback situation where ministers could intervene if um, inappropriate, it's, it's regarded as a particular area management uh, uh, statements or uh, are regarded as inappropriate. Is that? Ask the minister that. Yeah. Okay. Phil Thomas. Again, I, I can give a direct response. Um, that mechanism is there. And the mechanism is there in this sense, that the Fish Health Inspectorate puts a uh, risk rating, if I can describe it that way, on any area that it's inspecting. Mm -hmm. And if there was any element about a farm management agreement that they thought would increase a risk in an area, they would increase the intensity of the inspection. So there is a, a, a pressure on companies, if I can put it that way, if you don't want a fish farm inspector with you every day of the week, then you try to make sure pretty quickly if there's something that the fish farm inspectors are objecting to, mm -hmm. that's addressed. So that's the mechanism, that, that that's the fallback position, if you like. Um, the 2007 Act uh, does have provisions in it that would allow the, uh, the direct intervention of the inspectorate in running a farm. But that would not be a route that I think anybody would particularly want to go down. It would be much better for the farmers to respond and, and, and run their own farms. Thank you. I think um, we have to about five subjects that we want to get in, um, and we really would like to make some progress on them. So shorter answers and shorter questions on, first of all, led by Jim Hume on escapes, equipment and taking samples. <coughs> Okay, thanks. I'll, I'll divide it up into, into two parts, come to escapes in the, in the second part. But um, the first sort of question is, uh, the bill actually allows, or would allow Scottish uh, ministers to make subordinate legislation, that's uh, legislation in their own powers after the bill becomes an act, uh, for techni technical requirements for equipment, uh, and the equipment would have to be deemed fit, fit for purpose, and containment working group is uh, working on updating that. It would also... Um, uh, provide uh, in, in the bill uh, a part that uh, there would be a technical standard for Scottish fish farm uh, equipment. So I would like to know from the panellists uh, what they think about the approach uh, to the bill uh, is taken regarding that and if in, in their answers maybe uh, give us some information on how Scotland compares to other areas within their uh, technical standards. 
Okay, that's a start. Um, <coughs> well, Alan Wells wants to come in, right? Okay. Um, I think it's inevitable that the, the technical standard is delivered in secondary legislation because it's still being developed. Uh, is, is the simple and, and St St Steve uh, um, you know, chairs the chairs the group that's doing that, and uh, I think it's a very welcome welcome way forward. One one point I would make is that um, through that group uh, there was information collected on the reasons for escapes, and around about a third of escapes in 2010 were due to human error, so not actually anything to do with the technical standards at all. So it's it's, it's important to get that that point point on the record. Um, it's also worth uh, making clear that the, the reports um, of, of escapes are, are, are limited to, to, to reported escapes uh, by, by definition. Um, we, we are aware of, of quite a number of unreported escapes. And if I could just give you one example, and it's in the freshwater side of things, it's in uh, an area in, uh, in, in, in Sutherland uh, called Loch Shin. And basically that's an area which is impacted by, by hydroelectricity as well. And one of the issues is that the smolts were having difficulty getting past the dam. So the local fishery board and the local trust there set up smolt traps on a number of the tributaries into that, uh, into that loch in order to intercept the smolts and transfer them to the other side of the dam. There's two freshwater farms on that area. In one of the tributaries, more than half of the fish were of, wild or, were of farmed origin rather than of, 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 uh, of wild origin. And that happened to be the tributary nearest to one of the farms. The tributary nearest to the other farm had no fish at all. Of, uh, of farmed origin. So uh, the numbers that we're talking about in 2011, 288 non-native salmon caught in the trap in one individual tributary into Loch Shin. Last year, 540 fish caught in that trap. So it's just to give you an idea, there were no reported escapes in that loch whatsoever. So there, 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 there is a problem above and beyond what's actually been reported. Um, okay, you put that on the record. Um, Alex Adrian, first of all. Uh, the standard is going to be incorporated into secondary legislation, that you will also need to uh, address uh, a process whereby equipment development can be incorporated as well, because the, the industry, number one, it moves ahead very quickly uh, in terms of technological developments. And secondly, you have things like proposals for offshore farming. In a lot of cases, no one is, 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 is possibly that confident of, of what, what has been proven to work in one particular environment, how necessarily it will behave in another. And therefore, there must be scope to allow producers of, 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 these, of, of equipment to, to deploy and test and have a process whereby they know they can undertake a certain pro a process and have their equipment certified or tested that it is fit for purpose in a particular environment. So it's, it's process as well as just simply specification. Thank you. Um, Steve Bracken, please. You know, yes, I just wanted to say three things, uh, particularly about the, the technical standard. Um, I think when the group was first set up, the Improved Containment Working Group, that is, there was a universal belief that we needed to have a technical standard for the salmon and trout industries. Um, we looked at Norway because they lead in this, this kind of legislation. The standard there is called NITEC. And when we looked at it in a lot of detail, we realised it was very, very complicated. It had taken something like 90 people, over 90 people, uh, being involved over 10 years in the development of the standard. It was a huge piece of work. And I have to say, it, it's, it, it does the job. But in terms of understanding it on a day-to-day -day basis on a fish farm, it didn't really fit our bill. So what we've gone for is something that will be understandable by farm managers and their staff, and managing directors also. So it's, it's, got to be, it's got to be not quite unput downable, but it's something that you want to have there that's readily accessible and understandable by, by most people involved in the industry. Alan's uh, quite right about um, the human error side of uh, escapes, because we feel this is the second part to what we're doing as a group. And that is, yes, you've got the equipment being looked at and fit for purpose for all sites. But in giving sites equipment and very, very good equipment, you need to have people that are well trained in its use. So that's absolutely key. Um, I know that some of the companies uh, in, in the salmon industry have developed their own in-house training schemes, uh, containment training schemes, that is. And that's something that we want to spread out within the industry overall. We look at this in the same way as we look at sea lice, it's, it's an industry issue. Containment is an industry issue. So if we have good ideas, we want to be able to share them. Um, Angus McDonald's got a question about this just now that uh, pertains. 
Yeah, just um, following up on, on that point, um, I'm curious as to whether there's been any thought as to, well, particularly with regard to escapes, uh, with regard to using fish that are sterile. Has there been any uh, discussion within the industry on that issue? Yes, there is, there is discussion and there, there's, there's work ongoing on that. Um, but I think that uh, the way we see our job is to make sure that we, first of all, keep our fish where they should be, which is in the nets and the tanks. So our key priority is making sure that we've got uh, safe, contained facilities for our fish. And uh, Ken Whelan. Thank you, Chairman. Just two very quick points. Um, in the context of escapes, there are two ways that fish can escape. They can escape in the classic escape, where a cage goes down. But in the context of uh, some of the numbers that Guy mentioned earlier, if you're dealing with hundreds of thousands and millions of fish, there is, just by dint of uh, the physical containment of these fish, a leakage of small fish over time, particularly in freshwater. Biologically, funny enough, it's the small fish that may actually pose the greatest threat to us, because they are the ones that can adapt to the environment better, and they may very well pose a bigger threat. And I think the point of quantifying this, we've discussed this for a long, long time now, decades, in the context of the, of the debate o o over uh, fish farming. There are two new approaches, I think, which we might look at. First of all, in the context of a very large uh, salmon program that was involved in looking at salmon at sea, we've developed new genetic techniques which can very quickly tell you whether or not a fish is a fish farm of wild origin. I think we need a monitoring of the wild stock uh, in the context of the spawning stock in particular and the juveniles, just to quantify this. Is it a problem or is it not? I think some of that work is already ongoing. Secondly, I really would encourage the industry to look at the whole question of hard tagging. There are systems available now whereby nose tags can be put into the baby salmon. And if a proportion even of the sites where there are concerns, if they were tagged with these hard tags, at least we would know where the fish were ending up and exactly what farm they came from. I think that could be very useful in the context of individual issues where there are concerns. Um, I just want to make a point because I think it relates to what Alan Whale said. And it, it raises a question about the fact that there are on the same inland loch, uh, fish being bred for uh, hatcheries that feed the wild salmon and also those that are feeding uh, into fish farming. And uh, he mentioned Loch Shin, which is in my constituency, and I know the circumstances there. And uh, I think it's a, a concern that uh, we will try and tease out. I wouldn't like it to be said that, for example, at the hatchery, uh, we don't know the hatchery, which uh, is uh, breeding uh, smolts for the river is any better than the hatchery that's breeding smolts for fish farming because the fish farming company is working in five other lochs as well. And, uh, you know, I think we've got to be careful about balancing out that information and we'll try and tease it out in a written form later on, try and find that out. There's also a case, obviously, in some lochs where in the same uh, farming structure there's fish being... Uh, grown for both wild and uh, farmed circumstances. So, you know, that's a matter where the technical standards are very important to us. So we know these issues and we'll explore them a bit further with some other witnesses. OK. Jim. Just uh, after the few comments here that obviously human error is part of it, uh, and just to further the conversation that we're having, um, do, do some of the panellists think that we should therefore have mandatory training uh, for the use of fish farm equipment? Also, should we have a s regular sampling of, uh, of fish that are, are being uh, farmed? And would it actually be practical to tag fish? It would be useful to know. Thank you. Right, Phil Thomas first. Uh, take the points you've mentioned, but to lead with one that was your previous point. On secondary legislation, the main concern the industry has about secondary legislation relates to the whole, uh, I think it's, uh, it's referred to as charging for progress, or words to that effect in, in, in the original uh, consultation. Uh, and, and that is, there is great concern that at the moment the bill puts under secondary legislation uh, the, the, the whole introduction of charging, and we think that should be specifically looked at service by service. The industry has no difficulty at all with the notion that it would pay for services. It does have difficulty with the notion it would simply pick up core costs of government. So that's uh, a part of our consultation. In relation to uh, 
uh, the other points that, that you've made. Uh, I think um, you would find no difficulty at all with, with, from an industry standpoint with the notion that, that Ken has raised of wild fish being, being uh, sampled in terms of, of their uh, genetics. The one problem in the bill at the moment is a technical problem, uh, and that is that the way the bill is written, uh, a suspected uh, escape at one farm would potentially trigger sampling at every farm in the whole of Scotland just simply the way the text is written, and we think that's unreasonable. We have no difficulty with the notion that if there's an escape in an area that farms in that location should be sampled, but to, to, to put the additional cost and burden on of sampling every farm we think is unreasonable. But the important thing is to monitor the wild fish, not the farm fish, if I can describe it that way, because if you're going to look for, for escapes, it's the wild fish population is the one that's key. Right, uh, Alan Wells... Uh Alec Kinnaman and Claudia Beamish, before we move on to the next subject, we have several more questions to ask, and people will be wondering when we start to take a recess uh, if, uh, for, for, for just human purposes at the present time. So please keep your remarks short. Very quickly, just answer those uh, two points from, from, from Phil. Uh, first of all, I'll give you an example why it's important to be able to sample widely. And again, it's the case of Loch Shin. When the first time that those smolts became uh, found in the wild, the fish had already been moved from the freshwater site out into the seawater. If you want to find out where the escapes come from, you have to be able to trace them out to the seawater cage, wherever that might be, and sample from there. So it's very simple why you need to have this wide uh, system. I agree with Phil that you need to be able to sample the wild fish, but equally you need to be able to have the baseline data from the farm fish. RAFS, Rivers and Fisheries Trust of Scotland, are currently operating a project trying to look at just that, but the aquaculture industry appear to be unwilling to provide those baseline samples, which makes determining the level of a problem, if any, almost impossible. Alec Kinnaman. Um, this point, but just going back to causes of escape, and... Uh, 30% of escapes in 2011 were caused by predators. And I think in, in the development of a technical standard, we really need to prioritise um, you know, gaps in knowledge about how predators attack the net and to, so they can find the most effective and benign way to deal with that problem. Because you know, last year, there were 242 seals killed uh, at, at fish farms in Scotland. And, and that's no good for wildlife. And, and quite frankly, it does, does the industry no favours either. So that really needs to be prioritised in, in the development of that standard. I'm going to bring in uh, Graham Day on that point and then come back to Claudia Beamish. Yeah, thank you for that intervention because that's exactly the part of what I was going to come on to. In, in trawling through the evidence that we've had in writing, I, I noted an assertion that only 20% of fish farms possess anti-predator nets, and uh, only 13% of these are actively being used. If that is correct, does that mean that the seals are not a major problem for the industry, or is there an over-reliance on obtaining shooting licences or using acoustic deterrence to deal with the issue? Steve, Bracken. Yeah. Um, we used anti-predator nets back in the 1970s and 80s. And these are nets, just to explain, that hang outside the main net uh, where the fish are contained. They tend to be four to six inch mesh in, in size. And when you deploy these nets, in our experience, and I've seen this, all sorts of wildlife get trapped in those nets. And it's very, very unpleasant. So we've gone down the route of tensioning nets, and we're not alone in this, that, Many in the industry are doing the same thing, tensioning the nets. And this is really a function of the size of the pens that we're dealing with today. You've got a bigger volume of net. And just to explain, some of the bigger nets can be the size, can have the volume of five Olympic-sized swimming pools. Very, very big volumes. So with those nets, you need to have them really well tensioned, and that makes it hard for the seal to attack the pen. In addition, we put in the base what are called seal blinds. These are just nets that are finer mesh and so the seal finds it hard to come up from underneath and, and see fish. With the acoustic deterrents, yes, we use those as well. We see those as a very, very important part of our equipment. And yes, I, I know about you know, issues with cetaceans, but I think with the development of this kind of equipment, more and more it's been looked at that the equipment needs to be designed so that it's not going to affect cetaceans, but there's a lot of work to be done there. But we would much prefer to find ways of keeping the seals away from our fish 
including looking at, uh, we're going to trial uh, in the next few weeks, uh, beginning of next year, putting a copper base net, a mesh, into the base of one of our, our nets, just to see what happens there. We're looking at new materials, uh, one in particular that's called sapphire netting, which is high density polyethylene, and you can run uh, through that stainless steel wire. So all of these netting developments are being looked at very, very seriously. In practical terms, the acoustic deterrent, I mean, what prompts you to switch it on or do you leave it running? It's a very good question. It depends on the, the farm itself, the farm manager, and what he believes works best on his farm. Um, through experience, uh, some farmers will switch it on at the beginning uh, in the belief that they don't want the seal coming near the farm at all. Other farm managers will wait until there's a problem and then put them on. What can happen with acoustic deterrence is that the seal gets accustomed to that noise. So it's really down to the farm manager to use his best judgment on how to deploy it on his farm. Thank you. Uh, you'll understand that uh, we are concerned with acoustic noise in the sea in a wider sense from the point of view of wild uh, animals, cetaceans and so on. And this is an added potential hazard for them. Have you had any difficulties in sea loss that uh, have occurred from uh, the basis of dolphins or whales or whatever? Anecdotally, um, there are occasions where farm managers will say, well, we've seen um, uh, porpoises, dolphins in, in the loch. The seal scare has not been on. It's been switched on. They're still around and they're going to move out. That's not a scientific trial. So I, I, I wouldn't be able to say accurately that this, this is how how it is. But just, just to say, there is one new device that's, that's on the horizon and uh, we're very interested in it. And this is uh, a noise. It's not a loud noise. These seal scarers are about 180, 190 decibels. But this one is like the sound of fingers scratching a blackboard. So it, it's, it's a noise that the seal doesn't like and, and reacts accordingly. So it's just to point out that there are new developments coming along all the time. Thank you for that. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I can fully understand as an ex-teacher the thought of uh, the noise of um, fingers scratching a blackboard. It's no good for the kids or anyone. But in fact, my questions were about seals, and I'm glad that the questions have been covered, because I do think it's important in view of the evidence that we've received from people. So I have no further questions. Thank you. Can we move on to well boats uh, just now? Uh, Angus MacDonald. Yes, thank you, um, convener. Um, Panel, we've heard from previous evidence sessions uh, that to avoid spread of parasites and disease, uh, well boats will require to be modified, uh, and a government official um, estimated the cost of retrofitting each boat at uh, around £500,000. Um, so with regard to the retrofitting of well boats, um, I'd be interested to, to hear what uh, would be the cost to industry uh, to comply with this. And given uh, the time constraints, convener, um, I have another point with regard to um, the SEPA proposition to simplify the consenting regime, uh, where, uh, where it and not Marine Scotland would be responsible for consenting discharges from well boats. Uh, and I'd be curious to hear what uh, panel members think of SEPA's proposal. Okay. Phil Thomas. In consenting regime, the industry would be fully supportive of it. The industry has been identifying it as an area of problem to have two separate licenses where you're discharging the same material into the same place but from different sources. It just doesn't make sense from a, a, an industry standpoint. In terms of retrofitting uh, on well boats, um, everybody in the, in the industry would be supportive of that. The cost will be massive, I have to tell you, and um, there'll be a need. Uh, in effect to phase these things in because it's much easier in truth to, to put the right installation in when, when a new boat is being brought in rather than to retrofit. So there will be commercial cost considerations uh, in terms of how you do that. The one um, problem with the bill, which I, I just will identify, is there's an issue in the bill which we, we've already raised with the bill team about the definition of well boats. Uh, as the bill is currently written, the definition of a well boat would actually cover pretty well every boat that goes anywhere near a fish farm. Uh, and that's obviously neither the intention uh, nor is it practical. So the, the definition of a well boat, uh, I hope, will be adjusted in the final version. Okay. Any other points from people there? George Farlow. 
Thank you, convener. I think m most people in the tourist industry in the Highlands would prefer a well boat to look like a boat. That would be useful. Thank you. But even nicer to know if they could be built in Scotland at some point. Yes? If I can break in, I think there's some confusion. Uh, I think George is probably referring to feed barges. Uh, and and uh, from that standpoint, the industry also prefers feed barges to look like boats. And it has a particular issue in relation to the fact that we have problems all over the country uh, that, that arise through the boats being uh, required as part of the planning system to, to be painted different colours in different places. It's a separate issue. Thank you. Um, we'll move on. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yep, <coughs> certainly. With regard to the, the well boats, um, I, I've noted uh, in my travels that all the well boats that I've seen seem to be registered in Olesund in Norway. Um, and I'm curious as to whether the panel members would think there's perhaps a monopoly uh, going on where uh, there don't seem to be any Scottish boats registered uh, at all. Um, would it, how many, for a start, how many um, well boats are there operating in Scotland and are they all registered in Norway? Bill Top, who's going to answer that? Of Norwegian boats operating in Scotland, but you're right, they are the ones that have the monopoly uh, in Scotland and indeed probably the world when it comes to, to salmon farming. I think the reason for that is that well boats have developed as the industry has out in Norway. Their methods of farming have demanded that they, they have hatcheries close to the shore, for example, well boats are ideal for taking the smolt straight from the hatchery. So they've developed this technology and uh, have embraced it, I have to say, whereas in Scotland that's not been the case, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Can we move on to commercially damaging species now? Uh, Margaret McDougall. Thank you, convener. And uh, in the interest of the time scales that we are under pressure that we are now under, uh, I'm not going to go into a preamble about uh, the commerci commercially damaging species and take it that all the panellists are familiar with the, the aspect of the bill. <coughs> so could the panellists perhaps give their views on proposals on commercially damaging species? And what do witnesses think about the way the bill would define a commercially damaging species? SIPA have a view on this? Particular comment to make? Uh, no. <laughs> Alex, Adrian. Um, if I may, I, I think the bill refers, uh, by example, to the Mytilus trossilus, um, uh, I wouldn't call it an outbreak, but occurrence in, in locatives. And I think Mytilus trossilus is a species of mussel. Okay. Um, just as a bit of background then, um, mussels formed in Scotland are chiefly the blue mussel, Mytilus edulis. Mytilus trossilus is a species that has a very soft shell and very low meat yield and generally is picked off in the wild by predators quite happily, so it doesn't occur. But it, in a farming environment, it's protected and therefore it flourishes and it displaces the blue mussel to the uh, commercial um, impact, if you like, of, of, of mussel farmers in Orkative. The problem is that it's not an, an invasive non-native as such. So I think the bill has to be quite broad in picking up something that, as it says, is commercially damaging. It's not necessarily environmentally damaging. It's not damaging in, in the wild as such. But in a commercial context, it has an impact. And therefore, it's quite hard to be prescriptive about just how that will be. I think the bill actually says these things will arise when they arise. And what we want to do is be prepared for them when they when they when they uh, they do arise. Um, I say the the trossilus um, event, just by way of example, locative is is quite a uh, a lock with a, quite a low salinity. It has a high fresh water input. The surface layers are, are, are of a salinity below 30 parts per thousand. Um, that suits metallus trossilus. It, it the farming environment protects the mussel, and as I say, over time, it displaced the the commercial blue mussel to the uh, to the detriment of the of mussel production in that lock, such that the lock now is completely cleared out of all mussel production, and there is an attempt to fallow all farms, get rid of the the, the, the background population of trossilus, and then uh, restock with with the blue mussel. Um, 
So that's it really, I think, it's just it be broad enough to catch these things when they arise because no one can really pick them out. They're not invasive non-natives and they're not necessarily damaging in their own right. It's only when you apply the commercial context. Alec Kinnaman? I, mean, I don't have any detailed comments on this, but it's just one of the aspects of the bill um, defines a commercially damaging species as something that is itself without commercial value. And I think there's danger mm -hmm. in that, that something without just because something is without commercial value doesn't mean it doesn't have environmental or ecological value. So I think there needs to be, um, you're right, I mean, it's, it's something that's been brought in in specific circumstances, but it is in itself been presented as quite wide ranging. And I think there's a bit of danger in that. And so I would think at the very least that before something is defined as a commercially damaging species, that would be a level of consultation, at least with Scottish Natural Heritage, on, on that factor. Because I, I, I think it can, <coughs> the potential is to be quite damaging there. Uh, uh, Phil uh, Thomas. Uh, the, the main problem uh, that um, we would see with the bill uh, uh, is that it is triggered by the mitral trosselous uh, problem that Alex has already referred to, but is cast in very broad terms. Uh, now, the problem with that is it's cast in very broad terms, in specifically in relation to fish farms, but fish farms are not the issue. The issue that, that you have with those sort of species coming in is movement to the species, and the big issue in the middle of that is movement to boats, particularly um, inshore boats. Uh, and the, the things it doesn't pick up, for example, is um, plant species, where there is a concern long term that if we had an evasive plant species, it would clog nets on fish farms, but doing something about that shouldn't be focused on the fish farm, it should be focused on how the species got there, and that almost universally refers to boats. So we see it as being too limited in a way, and would have preferred them to uh, have put in the opportunity for secondary legislation to get something a bit more comprehensive. Okay, your point's made. Um, Margaret McDougall, want to follow that up or move on? To no, just, uh, you know, ministers at the moment will have the right to enter into control agreements and where the farmer doesn't agree, you know, they can actually just enforce this. So I take it everyone's agreed that that's the way it should happen. Yeah. Well, Phil Thomas. On the specific. Um, there's an inconsistency there, for example, that as the bill is written at the moment, if you had a, a plant species infestation, if I can call it that, on a fish farm, the bill would allow something to be done about the fish farm, but that same plant species could be, be um, established, for example, on a local pier, but the bill wouldn't allow you to do anything at all about uh, the, the species on the pier. So you have the, the problem that you would deal with one aspect, but it wouldn't really solve the, the, the issue in a more general sense. And it's the limited nature of what's there is the point of concern, I think, as well. As well, we have legislation on invasive species anyway at the present time, which uh, might well overlap there. And uh, without prolonging this particular thing, I think Margaret's made a, a very fair point. <coughs> Shall we move on to charging just now? Uh, uh, the, the issue about charging, uh, perhaps. We have the panel's views on the proposals for new powers of Scottish ministers to set charges in relation to agriculture. And is it right that the government should be able to charge the industry for the cost of regulating it? And the SSPO submission seems to suggest that it would rather that some of the work which is or could be done by the government is done by the private sector. Is that what it means? Phil Thomas? Well, um, we have two specific points. The one is that we believe that for any charges to be introduced, they should be dealt with through the Parliament via the affirmative procedure. Uh, and that's quite, quite a crucial issue for us because we think any charge needs to be looked at specifically by Parliament on its way through. In relation to um, the uh, specific provision of services, there are already established uh, services, for example, for diagnostics on a commercial basis. And I think it's fair to say that every single company in Scotland uses the commercial service in preference to the service that uh, is available through Marine Scotland. So for us, it, it, it would be a question of saying, 
why would you introduce a charge for a Marine Scotland service or require a Marine Scotland service to be used when there are already commercial services available that do exactly the same thing uh, and judge on a commercial basis rather better? So it's not an issue of charging, it's an issue of structure. Um, we do think that if you're going to introduce charging procedures uh, on, on any basis for anything, that there is a need to review the operation of Marine Scotland. The starting point has to be to say, Marine Scotland, when it was established, was established under rather uh, unusual circumstances, if you recall, uh, in the sense that it was clubbed together from existing organisations uh, and parts of government, um, rather than starting with a, a remit and working back as to what you would want. <coughs> so if you're going to start charging for anything, I think you need to have a proper assessment of what exists and what they do. That will be the starting point. And then in, any individual charges for anything, really, would need to be considered by Parliament through the affirmative procedure. Any other points on that just now? If not, um, can we move on to uh, Steve Bracken, yes. Thanks, Convener. Yes, just to say, when it comes to audits and technical inspections, we have provided Marine Scotland with a whole range of schemes that we're involved with. That's, that's the industry. And I think it would, be, it would be helpful if those could be studied and perhaps used in any future audits and inspections rather than go and reinvent the wheel and coming up with a new audit scheme. We'll ask them about that. Thank you very much. Um, Alec, uh, George Farlow on this point. Thank you, convener. Uh, just something that ha has interested us, um, reg it does regard smolts, and as we look forward to 2020, if there's an expansion in fish farming, there's obviously um, uh, uh, consequential expansion in, in smolt production. Um, a few years ago, the um, Highland Council one of the area planning committees gave uh, planning for expansion to a small company in Highland, and uh, but that was conditioned that that planning only lasted ten years, and um, I think um, they would then therefore was as that uh, period uh, came to its conclusion, they would have to ask for. Uh, uh, reapplication, um, and I just wondered what um, facilities there were for for this with um, marine um, fish farming. That that would be one of the ways of uh, controlling those companies that um, had had issues during that ten-year period. Anyone like to respond to that, or will we just leave it on the table? Phil Thomas. As, as a specific chairman, the, the whole basis of transfer of planning to the local authorities for fish farm approval was that it would give fish farms a permanency that would allow the companies to build the capital investment of the fish farm into the capital investment of the company. That was one of the, I wasn't about at the time, but that was the main argument or a main argument for transfer to local authorities. There is an issue which is an issue of real difficulty with short term licenses. And that is, if you, you want somebody to invest a lot of money in building a fish farm, they have to see a long enough period to get a rate of return on that and to maintain their capital. So uh, I have some difficulties, although I understand the, the point that George is making. I think we've chosen to go down one kind of route. If we were to go down a different kind of route, then you would have to look at the whole nature of the regime again, I think. That is a point we will take forward. Um, but in the meantime, a uh, question on fixed penalty notices. Thank you, um, Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, fixed penalty notices, what basically is going to happen is that uh, there will be, in most points of life, uh, we have a chance to pay a fixed penalty notice. Uh, so the situation is that... Uh, this will be offered out. What does the panel feel in regards to fixed penalty notices that it will uh, reduce court costs for both you and and the, the and government, and also will mean that the cases will be dealt quicker? Do you agree with that? Um, Douglas Sinclair first. Yeah, whilst whilst we don't <coughs> regulate under the under the the regime that's been discussed in part of the, the, the Aquaculture and Fisheries Bill, we have. 
parallel consultation and parallel new legislation uh, being developed at the moment, which will include provisions for fixed penalty notice with respect to environmental crime, let's say. And speaking as someone who came from the, the hard end of CEPA's business, I, I strongly support fixed penalty notices because the, the disposal of cases in court is incredibly costly, incredibly bureaucratic for both uh, the regulator and the regulated. Uh, and in many cases, I'm aware that people that we regulate and who may have faced a case in court would have preferred to take fixed penalty as, a, as an option, as a, as a lesser option for, for, for lesser crimes of lesser seriousness because of the, the, the cheapness, the immediacy and the, the, the fact that they can get the, the, the business out of the way, get, get the offence out of the way. So it's something that we certainly support in terms of a, a regulatory and enforcement regime. Thank you. Any other comments on that just now? Phil Thomas. The, the industry has been uneasy about fixed penalty notices. Uh, and the reason for that is there's been concern there that with an industry with no history of, of uh, major criminal transgressions of any sort, there was concern that, that A, um, we would find that there was a trivialisation of the process whereby fixed penalty notices were introduced. Uh, and secondly, that we would suddenly find that there were large numbers of fixed penalty notices that have an impact uh, on, on a company uh, from uh, its position in the market, if I can describe it that way, from its reputational position. And the thing that we would be keen to see, we've accepted that fixed penalty notices are going to be introduced, but we would be very keen to see that there's a requirement on Scottish Government to publish to st statistics on fixed penalty notices so that there is an ability to, to have a very clear view of what is happening over time. So our requirement really was be for information. See, that would be a breach of the Data Protection Act. If, uh, I, I see your company or another company was continually getting fined, would you not feel that you know you were getting picked on in some ways, that, and you know that your name was yeah. continually in the paper that you've been you've been fined? Well, um, the reality will be that, as we already know, anything that happens in the aquaculture industry right. is on the page of the newspapers the very next day. In, in fact, usually on the day before, if I can put it that way. So, so the notion that, that there is any um, lack of public awareness about no the secret, aquaculture industry... There's no secrecy in your, that, in your, right. in your business. But we, we do feel that there is an issue there. We, we have received reassurances from the Scottish Government and from the Bill team uh, about how fixed penalty notices will be dealt with. Um, and we've said that, that uh, you know, we're content with that. Um, we would like very clear guidance, and that's been provided, on what fixed penalty notices will apply to. And we would like to understand what the impact is in terms of... Because we have no record. I mean, the number of, of cases against aquaculture that have ended up in, in, in court are infinitesimally small. And therefore, if we started to see large rafts of fixed penalty notices appearing, we would have some concerns, frankly. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Um, uh, Steve Bracken would like to comment uh, on this point. Yes, just to add to what uh, Phil has just said, um, I think when the idea came out of fixed penalty notices, there was definitely a, a knee-jerk within the, within the industry because we didn't see this coming and we didn't understand what it was about. And so there was a lot of disquiet on the farms, not just marine harvest, but within the industry overall. But I think uh, since that time, uh, the build team have put out uh, good information that further explains what the fixed penalty notice is about. The original thought was that these would be immediate on the farms, but the process has now been explained. So that does help. I'm not saying it's being endorsed, but it's better understood. OK, thank you for that. Um, we've... Uh had a very wide range of remarks and evidence so far. Uh, we just have a couple of questions to finish up with. And if it's a very small point Claudia Beamish wishes to make, that would be helpful. Uh, it might be quickly answered. It's certainly not a small point, convener, but it may be that, that um, panellists wish to submit further written evidence if, if they feel that there isn't the opportunity to to highlight the points. It's really a, you took a, the words out of my mouth. It's a broad sorry. <laughs> it's a broad question, quite simply, about particularly in view of the delay of the National Marine Plan, whether the cumulative effect of of um, fish farms have uh, any if any panelists have concerns about that in relation to the marine environment um, broadly. Ken, well, 
Chairman, to make one comment in relation to the broader marine environment and it relates to the other part of, of, your, uh, of, of your work down the months. That's in relation to the whole question of climate change. Certainly in the context of the work I've been involved in, which we're just about to publish a major publication on, which looks at 50 years' data, there is very clear evidence at this stage that our bays are changing, and they're changing quite fast. It poses, I think, to yourselves as, uh, as uh, uh, advisors in terms of the legal basis of various acts a real challenge in terms of the, the dynamic, whereas in the past it might have been sufficient to put something in place that you expected to last for maybe 10 or 20 years. I think... The dynamic of what's happening in the bays is really essential at this stage that in some way uh, the bill takes account of the fact that on a regular basis that the actual environment within which the industry is actually functioning, that, that there's a very clear overview in relation to that, relates directly back to two things. Number one, the capacity issue that we talked about before may very well be that in the future the capacity of these bays, particularly inshore, to take these very large amounts of fish may, may be compromised. Secondly, in relation to the actual number of cycles of sea lice, and we have some good published evidence that as a result of increasing temperatures in bays, sea lice naturally are producing more cycles within a given year. And thirdly, in the context of the very important point you mentioned once during the discussion previously, this is the whole question of space and how we utilise the full space to allocate the, even the existing industry. I think all of that relates directly back to the Bay's ability to be able to handle these particular impacts into the future in a very quickly changing environment. That's a very major point to make there. Uh, Alex Adrian, if you're very brief. Very, very quickly. Thank you, convener. I'd just like to make the point that uh, this industry, fish farming and aquaculture, needs the pristine environment. You know, it, it is not divorced from its environment. It relies on its pristine environment. And I'll just make one point that very many years ago, at the outset of aquaculture, it was considered a good thing that you, you had a commercial interest going into the marine environment that relied on the good status of that environment. Therefore, you, in, in some respect, and it may seem odd in this context, you have guardians of the environment out there, whereas before you didn't. You know, sitting on the shore and... and, 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 and uh, proselytising about the marine environment is one thing. Being out there and taking the risks commercially about the pristineness or otherwise the environment is entirely different. And they, it, we should just bear in mind that the aquaculture relies on the good quality of the environment. Uh, and uh, Douglas Sinclair to finish up this point. Just, just that point on cumulative impact. With regard to the things that we manage, the, the nutrient and pollutant impacts, we're certainly confident that the, the, the cumulative impacts of those components are well managed in Scottish coastal waters. Thank you for that. Um, we've got a, a general uh, point to wrap up on. I should just say you know, that there are people here in some cases who need to be informed of what's been said here so that they can have their point of view. And to reiterate what uh, Claudia Beamish has said, uh, we will look for follow-up uh, evidence from people if they feel that's necessary because we intend to try and build a confident view in the committee of uh, the whole issue related to this bill because as a vast importance to many parts of uh, our natural environment as well as our industries. And with that in mind, I'd just like to finish up with a question about um, what are the respective economic benefits of salmon farming and the wild salmonid fisheries? <coughs> That's fine. I've got an answer there. <laughs> Yes, Alex Adrian again. I, I, just, um, I think the, 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 there's figures to indicate that the values. One thing I'd just like to do is, is echo a NASCO comment, uh, the North Atlantic um, some Conservation Organisation comment that was made a number of years ago. <coughs> they, they, they are both part of Scotland's salmon sector. You know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't try and separate them out too much. And I think the fact that there, and, uh, there, there are benefits to be derived on both sides. You have expertise in the salmon sector that if you look at the, some of the, the articles and questions that are raised, I have seen in, 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 wild, in wild fish interest papers, are saying, well, why don't we take advantage of some of this? So that there's value and there's value to each sector as well. <coughs> on the farm side as well, there is a lot of interest in retaining the Scottish identity of some stocks or retaining the ability to... to to assist in the retention of that, uh, their integrity. So I think we shouldn't just lose sight of the fact that there are benefits to be accrued and value to be accrued in addition to simply the economics as well. It's a balanced set of comments. Um, uh, Alec Kinnanman. I think that's a very good question actually to end on, but I'd like to say that 
often, and we get into this discussion between sort of fish farming and, and salmon salmon fishing as, as, as two elements that kind of operate in isolation from other things. And I think it goes back to that other point about we are need to go beyond that and go down a strategic way that we can manage our marine environment that's holistic and takes not just, not just on one hand fish farming and, and salmon fishing on the other, but actually look at the, not just the economic but the social impact uh, or benefits that we can de derive from our coasts, coastal habitats and our marine waters. You know, wildlife tourism is, is a major factor in, 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 in a lot of the areas that we're talking about here. Um, so I think, you know, marine planning, as, as Claudia has mentioned, mentioned there, needs to take that strategic view and balance those multiple activities so that we can get the kind of gains from everything. Okay, thank you. And Steve Bracken. Yeah, yeah just to say that uh, when you look at the Scottish uh, salmon farming industry, we... I guess, are producing somewhere in the region of £400 million pounds plus, and uh, wild fisheries, I believe, in the region of £113 million. Yeah, I've got that right. Yeah. Um, and both... As, as you as know, in this Parliament, we have to have our figures absolutely, absolutely correct. correct. I'm talking millions, I'm talking, just to be clear, absolutely clear. But I agree entirely with Alex. These, these are both vital industries for the, the coast and inland parts of Scotland. And uh, we can go on and become bigger and better in both areas. I'm absolutely sure of it. But um, I think it's not going to happen overnight. But we need to look at, at the, the economic values of those industries and also the spin-offs. When you look at cities and towns on the West Coast and in the Highland region, for example, we contribute a lot to the vitality of the economies in these, in these communities. I think that's an interesting point, I think, to, to finish up on. At the moment, we could perhaps go on all day, uh, although w losing the will to live has been suggested by some people near to me. But it is, it's been a fascinating session. I have to say um, that it's um, excellent that we've had such a wide range of views. Uh, we've had time to do so. And as I've said earlier, I'd like to thank all of you for giving <coughs> us of your time and indeed of your views. Uh, and therefore, as this session has now ended, uh, I will suspend the meeting uh, to move into private session and clear the public gallery, which is very extensive. And indeed, all of our witnesses are around here. So thank you very much. And that ends the public section of this meeting.